Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the focus session titled Bench to Bedside, Maryland's Accelerating Cures Initiative and Beyond. My name is Ben Antebi, and I'm the Associate Director of the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund, or MSCRF. Today, we'll hear more from our experts in the cell therapy and regenerative medicine field about their cutting edge research funded through MSCRF. I'll start by providing a brief overview of MSCRF, and then we'll move on to our speakers. So MSCRF was established in 2006 by the, gover by the governor and Maryland General Assembly through the Stem Cell Research Act. Our purpose is to fund and promote stem cell funded stem cell, stem cell research through grants and loans. Our mission is to develop medical strategies to treat human diseases. And this is really the spectrum of diseases, anywhere from rare diseases um, to the most prevalent ones. Our fund offers seven funding programs that help transition stem cell research from the bench to the bedside. So in the next set of slides, I'll um, briefly highlight those seven programs. We have our postdoc fellowship uh, program, and this is intended really to train the next generation of stem cell scientists. But this program, we offer up to 130,000 uh, for a duration of two years. Our next uh, program in the pipeline is the discovery program. This is intended for high risk, high reward proposals. And uh, we do not um, require preliminary data for, for this program. This is really intended for out of the box uh, ideas. For this program, we offer up to 345,000 for a duration of two years. Our next program is our launch program. And this, is, uh, this program is intended for investigators that are new to the field of stem cell research. So this includes um, either new faculty um, that are, are trying to um, get their labs going uh, within five years um, of this um, of the RFA of starting the position, or seasoned researchers um, of any rank um, that have never done human stem cell research. Um, for this program, we offer up to three hundred fifty thousand for a duration of two years. Our next program is our validation program. As the, as the name suggests, this is to validate uh, technologies um, and really move it um, uh, further into commercialization through the creation of uh, startup companies um, or university uh, spin-outs. Uh, for this program, we offer up to 250,000 for a duration of two years. Our next program in the pipeline is our commercialization program. And this is um, mainly intended for startup companies and is really to move their technologies uh, further down the line towards the, uh, towards the commercial sector. For this program, we offer up to 400,000. And uh, this is for a duration of one year as opposed to all of our other programs, which are two years in duration. Our next program is our clinical program, and this is to conduct uh, clinical trials um, uh, using human stem cell research. This is, um, this could be, it doesn't um, have to be only in the state of Maryland. So this could be a multi-site trial. Um, the only um, condition is the funded site has to uh, be in Maryland. So we definitely, um, um, uh, like uh, our collaborations with other institutions. Uh, for this particular uh, funding program, um, we uh, require a one-to-one -one match of non-state funds. And uh, we offer up to $1 million and it's a duration of two years. Our uh, last, uh, certainly not least, is our uh, new offering. Uh, new program, uh, manufacturing assistance program. And this is uh, really to provide companies with the initial resources to build or advance 
the manufacturing uh, capabilities of, of cell therapy products in Maryland. Um, just like the clinical program, it has um, a one-to-one -one match requirement um, of non-state funds. It is up to $1 million uh, for a duration of two years. So this is a program in our nutshell. Also wanted to provide you with an overview. We have two funding cycles, a smaller one in mid-July, which is our the beginning of our um, fiscal year, and, and a second round, a larger round in mid-January with the um, offering the seven programs. We also wanted to share some metrics with you. Uh, since since we since we've been established, um, we uh, awarded more than five hundred grants, totaling over two hundred million in funding. To the right here, you can see um, our budget uh, as received by the uh, state of Maryland, and and you can see here that in two thousand and twenty three, here uh, further to the right. You can see a jump in over, we over more than doubled our funding um, from the state of Maryland. So we are at 20.5, uh, which is very uh, similar to our early years. Um, and we hope to continue that in FY for FY24. On the bottom, you can see the Accelerating Cures Initiative. The Accelerating Cures Initiative is really meant to, um, to accelerate the transition of, of therapies from the bench to the bedside. So you can see here um, from the, for the five years from 2017 to 22, uh, we've invested over $48 million and granted um, 165 awards to 25 different organizations. And just looking at the companies, um, from that perspective, we've supported 29 um, early stage companies uh, leading to 38 new projects. And you can see here um, on the bottom, um, just uh, the companies and the funds uh, that we've provided to those companies and the blue is the number of awards. You can see this steep increase in 2017 with the introduction of, excuse me, accelerating cures. And, and this is depicted also in the right in the bar graph in orange is the uh, introduction of accelerating cures as, as compared to the other years. And you can see the, the increase in the number of companies supported as well as the number of awards on the bottom. Um, we've also uh, um, uh, grouped disease indications. So if I mentioned we have um, uh, basically all of the disease indications that you can think of what, what we've done is really group them into this uh, into bigger classifications based on um, ICD codes and you can see that the uh, most prevalent um, disease classification that's funded through MCRF in Maryland is this is uh, the central nervous system and that's followed by the circulatory and musculoskeletal system diseases so this is our team to the right, um, and we have um, provided also some additional resources, um, including the um, link to our uh, request for applications, and this will be posted on our website. Um, of course, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to reach out. And with that, I'd like to thank you and uh, move on to our next speakers. I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. David Hackham. Dr. Hackham is the Garrett Professor and Chief of Pediatric Surgery at the Johns Hopkins University and Pediatric Surgeon in Chief and Co-Director of the Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Dr. Hackham is a leading authority on necrotizing, necrotizing enterocolitis, which is the leading cause of death in premature infants suffering from gastrointestinal disease. Dr. Hackham's research is focused on understanding the pathogenesis of and developing novel therapies for necrotizing enter entericolitis, or NEC, and his, his laboratory has identified a unifying theory that explains its development. Dr. Hackham is the past president of the Society of University Surgeons, past chair of the research committee at the American Pediatric Surgery Association, and past secretary treasurer 
of this of the Surgical Biology Club. His many awards and honors include a 2011 Hartwell Biomedical Research Collaboration Award to develop artificial intestine derived from patient-specific intestinal stem cells for the treatment of short bowel syndrome. Next, we'll hear more from, do from Dr. Heckham about his research funded through the MSCRF Discovery Program. The title of this talk is Stem Cell Therapeutic Approaches in Neonatal Necrotizing Enterocolitis. David, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the generous introduction. And it's just a pleasure to be here today to share our findings. And um, uh, the focus of today's discussion will be this condition, necrotizing enterocolitis, which is probably, as far as pediatricians and pediatric surgeons will tell you, the most important disease that you may never have even heard of. It's a disease that by the facts is very important. It's a leading cause of death from GI disease in premature infants. It affects up to one in 10 babies that are born prematurely. And in those that develop the disease, almost half will die. It's interesting that uh, though the um, development of neck occurs in premature infants, there are protective strategies, including breast milk, and neurologic injury is very common in the survivors of neck. And so there are long-term implications for children that suffer from this disease. And with respect to the current talk, in those children that develop neck short gut syndrome, where they lose uh, uh, a significant amount of their intestine beyond which they can actually survive, a condition called short bowel syndrome or short gut is very common. And this is so important that the most trusted name in science, CNN, obviously did a little piece uh, on this condition. I want to spend just a minute telling, uh, uh, just sharing with the audience the features of necrotizing enterocolitis, a little bit about its pathogenesis and its treatment, and then we'll launch into how an understanding of stem cell biology may provide insights into potential therapies for this condition. And when we think about neck as pediatric surgeons or as pediatricians or neonatologists, these creatures come to mind, these dragons. Now, you will recognize these are real dragons that we captured for the purpose of this talk. These are not computer-generated dragons. And <clears throat> the, the reason that we use dragons as... Um, as uh, the reason dragons come to mind when we think about neck is the four uh, biologic features of these entities. First, they're incredibly destructive with massive inflammation, as you can see here. They're very difficult to manage, often uh, resulting in death. You always require a surgeon, usually a burn surgeon, and they need to be tamed. And the same is true of neck. And so this is a little baby <clears throat> that I actually operated on. Uh, who has necrotizing enterocolitis. You can see the, the small size of the infant, the, the bedside caregiver's ring as compared to the uh, ankle of the child, just to give you some idea of how small the baby is, how distended the abdomen is. The child is on a, a ventilator. And when we operate on these kids, we see a complete necrosis of parts of the intestine. And so not unlike dragons, incredibly destructive, difficult to manage. You always need a surgeon. And, and to, to put this in context and why this work is so important, why we're so grateful for agencies like MSCRF to take a risk on us in discovering new approaches for neck, uh, this, this is neck in real life. Um, and this is a patient of mine shared with uh, the baby's dad. This uh, The picture is the last we ever took at home. It's taken on the way down for a doctor's appointment. This is baby Freddie. He was admitted to the hospital, never came home. You can see how jaundiced the baby is uh, and how... Um, uh, uh, puffy the cheeks are, these are all signs of short bowel syndrome, jaundice being caused by liver failure uh, from the, um, the short bowel syndrome. And in case you need additional evidence, uh, in addition to that really heart-wrenching picture, um, whilst there's been increasing incidence in research on neck, and these are just articles published uh, from perhaps 2000 and uh, 20 and before, a dramatic increase. The incidence of neck, at least requiring surgery in the black bars, hasn't really changed. Medical neck has. These are babies that respond to antibiotics, first-line treatment. And the survival has really not changed. And so you can see, uh, and this is across many centers, uh, around 40% really hasn't changed of those babies that require surgery. And so neck is, I hope I've convinced you, a real problem 
a common problem with a very uh, poor outcome. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you four overlapping stories. First, I'm going to share some insights from our lab and others as to the pathogenesis of NEC. And that's really shared to provide the foundation for these three interrelated stem cell stories. The first, as was touched on in the intro, is on the artificial intestine. The second is uh, the use of uh, 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 human uh, iPS cells to uh, uh, reveal a discovery platform in mouse with short bowel syndrome. And then third, and most recently, is our work on the amniotic fluid stem cell population as a novel therapy for neck. So let's jump right into the first story. And um, in a recent review uh, referenced here, uh, we described a unifying model that explains the development of neck. And uh, I will just share a little bit of supporting data uh, uh, that um, uh, attests to this uh, concept that during healthy delivery and shortly after birth, the previously sterile intestine of the newborn needs to be colonized with microbes from the environment and from the mother. And if that colonization, that is to say the interaction between bacteria and the host occurs in a healthy way, the baby adapts, grows and develops. But if that uh, interaction between the microbiome and the host is abnormal, then neck develops. So a very straightforward concept. And in seeking to understand the pathways that might mediate the interaction between bacteria and the host and newborns, we some years ago turned to the toll-like receptors, which are a family of innate immune receptors, uh, the first of which that was identified was toll-like receptor four, which recognizes the bacteria that are seen in infants with neck, which led us to uh, really uh, focus our attention early on in a collaboration with Bruce Beutler and Ruslan Mezitov. You see Bruce uh, receiving the Nobel Prize for his discovery of uh, <clears throat> uh, these molecules. And in a series of additional studies, we showed that the expression of TLR4, this receptor for gram-negative bacteria, which colonize the intestine babies with neck, is elevated by protein and gene in an mRNA in human infants with neck. This is uh, the resected specimens. And so uh, that suggests, but by no means proved, that TLR4, this innate immune receptor, may have a role in the pathogenesis of neck. And so to test that directly now, some 20 years ago, we developed a mouse model of the disease where we take mice and we gavage feed them formula, whereas breast milk is protective, formula is uh, is um, uh, promotes the development of neck. We subjected them to the very conditions seen in human disease, that is to say, brief episodes of hypoxia, uh, a microbiome that is enriched in gram-negative bacteria, so we take human stool and administer that. And then in four days, wild-type mice shown in the first two panels develop the edema and the mucosal destruction that is seen in human neck. And this is mouse neck, but it looks very much like the human disease. In mice lacking TLR4 on the intestinal epithelium shown here, these mice are actually protected from neck. The bowel is pink and healthy. The mucosa is intact and pro-inflammatory gene expression is reduced. <clears throat> so this indicates together that TLR4 signaling in the lining of the gut induces neck. So how does that happen? In a series of studies, we showed that TLR4 activation by bacteria regulates the balance between injury, which occurs through apoptosis, and repair, which occurs through cell migration and cell proliferation in the gut, which leads to restoration of the barrier. Shown here is just one uh, piece of evidence in support of the fact that TLR4 activation prevents migration. You can show these, you can see these are intestinal epithelial cells that are migrating into a wound in the absence on the left or the presence on the right of bacterial endotoxin, showing that TLR4 activation prevents migration. And that occurs through upregulation of focal adhesions, essentially preventing cells from getting out of the crypt. And in a series of additional studies, we uh, went on to uh, address how the ischemia occurs that is so 
uh, uh, defining in this disease. And uh, we showed that in the early stages, as mentioned, TLR4 shown here in these uh, red icons, activated by bacteria leads to destruction through apoptosis, impaired migration, which allows bacterial translocation to occur, which then activates TLR4 on the endothelium, causing a loss in nitric oxide release and then vasoconstriction that is shown here in the summary slide. Here's neck again in a wild type mouse. When we delete TLR4 from the endothelium, you can see that the mucosa remains fairly intact and uh, the, uh, the uh, as there's very good blood supply now, the, the uh, intestine is pink. This is not simply a problem in mice. TLR4 signaling, uh, uh, there's uh, several lines of evidence causes neck in humans. And uh, the evidence for that is shown here, including the fact that activating mutations in the pathway are seen in neck and breast milk, which protects neck, is enriched in TLR4 inhibitors. And then the final piece of evidence, and I alluded to this earlier, is in a prospective study published in The Lancet in which patients that went on to develop neck stool was assessed over time. Uh, patients who developed neck had an increase in gamma proteobacteria which are uh, bacteria enriched in endotoxins, which activate TLR4 as compared to controls. So why is it that TLR4 signaling by these gamma proteobacteria leads to neck? Well, evidence for this is shown in these slides here. Uh, it, and this is in situ hybridization, where we show that TLR4 is present on the intestinal stem cells, which are shown down here. Here's TLR4 in a wild type. And you can see, uh, sorry, here's TLR4 in a wild type on the left and a minus minus on the right. This is the stem cell marker LGR5. So TLR4 is expressed in the stem cells. And in fact, TLR4 in the developing gut has a role in normal gut development. It actually regulates notch signaling and the development of goblet cells. And in fact, if you uh, uh, take out TLR4, uh, you see uh, the, the cells divide very well. These are enteroids over time, but you get a disruption in goblet cell architecture. And uh, this occurs, as you can see, in a cell autonomous way. And so putting that together, TLR4 is present at very high levels in the gut during development. This is a mouse, but the same is true in human samples because of its role in normal gut development, because of its presence on stem cells. And so TLR4 expression rises during development, and then postnatally it actually falls. And so if a baby is born here, TLR4 is rising, then bacteria interact with it that are enriched in LPS and other ligands that activate TLR4, and then this de disease develops. And so putting that together, uh, this is exactly what I said, uh, TLR4 rises, TLR4 signals with bacteria causes a breakdown in the barrier, endothelial signaling, and then neck. And we've shown uh, through the use of novel uh, TLR4 antagonists that we can treat or even prevent the disease. And so that's a, a very fast survey of the uh, pathogenesis of neck. So uh, let's uh, dive into some of the stem cell approaches. And first, the artificial intestine is a, a, is a, a story that comes to us through this beautiful boy who reached out obviously on Christmas one day with a problem. He wanted to eat and he had short gut syndrome from a condition that led to short gut. And uh, he wanted to raise money. And actually, as was mentioned, uh, we received a Hartwell Investigator Discovery Award and that resulted in uh, some media exposure. He saw this. He saw we were developing an artificial intestine. He reached out offering to raise money. And he did so by selling cupcakes and presented me with a check for $60,000 selling cupcakes for this research. I share that just to show the human impact, the human toll of these diseases that have no good treatment and yet sort of fly under the radar, but under the radar no more. And so uh, the, the generation of an artificial intestine really requires three components, stem cells, of course, a scaffold, and the appropriate environment. So the stem cells in this particular case are going to be different than the stem cells that we'll be hearing about in the, um, in the subsequent two talks, uh, the two stories. Uh, these are the stem cells that are present in the crypts, the so-called crypts of lubricum. These are actually where TLR4 is located, and these are the cells that divide and differentiate and form the lining of the intestine, and in particular, each of these other subpopulations. And so we and others have developed techniques to grow, and this is the work of Hans Cleavers that uh, we've modified for our purposes. Uh, uh, we can grow these 
um, uh, stem cells into villi uh, ex vivo. And uh, they form these lovely crypts and they actually secrete. And we can do it from mouse, we can do it from human. And uh, they express the appropriate genes in a dish. And so those are the stem cells. So remember, we take these from the gut, from resected specimens. So we can take these in a patient-specific manner. We, in collaboration with John March's group at Cornell University, developed a scaffold uh, um, out of a, uh, an absorbable um, uh, 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 material uh, that was oriented using uh, laser imprinting into a uh, mold. Uh, that had villi that increased the surface area and looked very much like the villi of the native intestine. And so when we take these stem cells, we can cover the villi. This is synthetic. This is the native mouse. You can see the synthetic actually looks a little bit better. And so here is our workflow. We perform a bowel resection for patients with neck. We take their own stem cells. We expand them. We put them on the matrix. And then for the environment, we put them in the omentum, which gives it a blood supply. And then once there's a good blood supply, we hook up the bowel in continuity. And so I'll just show you the uh, success we've had. Uh, we have attracting a blood supply shown in here, von Willebrand factor. The, uh, the cells um, uh, acquire an immune system and they absorb. And they really, as you can see here in the implant into the colon, uh, they really uh, have a very smooth mucosal surface over time and they have goblet cells shown there. And uh, we've implanted these in large animal models here in the pig wrapped around the omentum, where it actually gets a very nice blood supply. As you can see here, this is not in continuity, but you can see uh, using laser angiography, you can see blood supply, very nice. And the pigs actually with their implanted artificial intestine do very well. The, uh, the, the technical barrier still to be achieved uh, is peristalsis. And uh, this is actually a major problem in the field. Uh, and we're trying to overcome this barrier using a combination of magnets and electromagnetic field, which allows uh, the, the intestine to essentially contract very much like uh, the native intestine. And this contract, the, there's an electromagnetic field around this. And so we would implant this in the patient with their own stem cells. The child would wear a vest and turn on the electromagnetic field for digestion, perhaps overnight, perhaps in recess. And then you can see uh, that this uh, will expel a bead. <clears throat> so uh, we're very excited about the uh, the prospect there. In the next few minutes, I, I want to share uh, two more stories that uh, shed light on the potential role of stem cells in uh, uh, providing novel therapeutics for patients with uh, the sequela of neck. And um, uh, in uh, the last uh, few years, uh, uh, with support from the Maryland Stem Cell Research Foundation, we developed a mouse human chimera to identify novel intestinal pathways uh, that are turned on in patients that have had neck and now have short bowel syndrome. So here's the model here. These are human IPS derived intestinal organoids. You can see the light microscopy, the expression of various different cell types. We then develop short bowel syndrome in a mouse. This has to be a rag mouse, so it doesn't reject the enteroids. And we uh, implant the uh, enteroids into the omentum. So it has the exposure that is seen in the setting of short gout. And then we perform a gene analysis, um, a transcriptomic analysis. The development of short bowel syndrome in a mouse uh, requires a fair bit of technical expertise. Here is the intestine. Uh, we uh, take the mesentery here, we perform a bowel resection, followed by an anastomosis, uh, which results in um, short bowel syndrome, uh, resulting in uh, significant weight loss in our control mice. And uh, you can see we're sewing together with very fine sutures, resulting very much in what we see in the human. In the interest of time, I'll stop the video there. Through this technique, now we can identify human genes in the human enteroids that uh, show preferential induction of various pathways that we can then therapeutically manipulate first in the mouse and then hopefully back to the human. And these are some of our key genes and we've targeted various pathways that are upregulated in the enterocytes that show promise in neck and neck induced short bowel syndrome. So all of that speaks to the sequela of short bowel syndrome uh, from neck, the sequela of neck, that is short bowel syndrome, 
Uh, but what about turning off the disease itself? And so in the final story, again, supported by the amniotic, uh, by the Maryland Stem Cell Foundation, the uh, Maryland's uh, Stem Cell Research Foundation, Research Fund, uh, is work on the amniotic fluid stem cells as a novel therapeutic approach for neck. And so uh, here's our uh, approach. Um, amniotic fluid stem cells, as I'll show you in a slide, have tremendous therapeutic uh, potential because of their anti-inflammatory roles and their multipotent roles. So uh, our approach is to, as mums undergo uh, um, uh, sampling of the amniotic fluid through a procedure called amniocentesis. Samni sampling of the amniotic fluid, we harvest the human stem cells, verify their properties, both their anti-inflammatory and their potency, their gene expression in models of neck. So let me just uh, uh, expand on this a little bit. Here are amniotic fluid stem cells that we obtain from moms with, of course, consent. These amniotic fluid stem cells are present in the first a trimester, and they really are of two varieties, secret positive and negative. We focus, of course, on the positive, which are clonal, capable of differentiation. They're very exciting because of their low immunicity. And proof of concept that these amniotic fluid stem cells may have a therapeutic role as shown here. This is endotoxemia. Remember, LPS is that ligand seen in the stool of patients with neck. And when we inject this into the peritoneal cavity, we see an induction in TNF alpha, which can be reduced in the presence of amniotic fluid stem cells. And uh, we see that these cells home to the gut when we label them, we can find them very easily in the gut. And in a model of neck in mice, the provision of amniotic fluid stem cells significantly reduces IL-1 expression, suggesting, uh, we would say excitingly, a potential therapeutic role in neck. So these are the four stories I want to share with you today. Neck, a devastating disease induced by TLF4 signaling. And we believe that stem cells may have approaches both in the sequela of neck as well as in the treatment. <clears throat> the disease itself uh, occurs in the setting of TLF4, but only through stem cell-based approaches and other out-of-the-box thinking uh, do we believe that we can actually uh, uh, have the opportunity to make a difference in the care of these kids? This work is a, a combination of studies uh, performed by some very talented investigators, and we're very, very um, appreciative uh, for their work, as well as the uh, MSCRF and other agencies that have allowed this work to happen. Thank you very much for your attention. David, thank you very much for... Excellent talk. I, I know uh, MSCRF finds your um, your large body of work very important and inspiring. Um, really enjoyed your talk. Um, I have lots of questions, but uh, just time for a few. Um, perhaps you can talk a little bit more about Nick, um, specifically its ideology, if it's known, um, are the infants, are they diagnosed during amniocentesis or after birth? And you've mentioned uh, surgical intervention um, for line of treatment. Is that the current line of treatment? And what is that? what does that entail exactly? Thank you. And thanks for your kind words. And I'm going to keep my answers brief so we get to more of your questions. Um, uh, essentially, uh, it is diagnosed after birth when the gut gets colonized First line of treatment is medical still, but in those patients that don't respond to antibiotic surgeries required, they have a very high mortality. And the underlying ideology is still of great interest and not well understood. Very good. Thank you very much, David. Um, so you briefly touched on this, and um, I, I'm very interested to, to learn more about that. Um, the the use of amniotic um, um, amniotic fluid stem cells, so you've mentioned anti-inflammatory um, capacity and, and getting that through uh, the mothers during amniocentesis. Um, are there any other uh, reasons to use amniotic stem cells? Um, I know it's a, it's a heterogeneous population, and I'd be very interested to learn more. Yeah, yeah, I, so we're very excited. They do, uh, just on, although we wouldn't have necessarily predicted this before we started this work, 
they do have the most powerful anti-inflammatory effect that we've seen in any of the agents that we've used to try and prevent neck. We're very excited and we're very excited to move this into large animal models. Their advantage, uh, despite being low risk uh, and high potency, is they can be tailored to the mom and the child, that dyad, which doesn't exist for anything else. So think of it as a tailored blood transfusion. If mom has a premature birth, we can get her amniotic fluid, we can bank the stem cells. And if the baby gets neck, which one in 10 will, it's sitting right there. It's a perfect therapy and it's just waiting to happen. We're excited to do it. Absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, and then uh, one more um, uh, technical question, if you will. Um, so you mentioned uh, breast milk is enriched with TLR4 inhibitors. Um, fact that I was not aware of. I'm sure the audience uh, was not either or some, somewhere, but um, was interested in, in understanding if there, you know, or you use any other approaches for as TLR inhibition antagonists, as you mentioned, uh, through breast milk or, or otherwise. Yeah, that's great. So very quickly, the 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 uh, breast milk is enriched in oligosaccharides, uh, a family called human milk oligosaccharides, which we've shown to be very protective. And essentially, TLR4 lipopolysaccharide uh, receptor recognizes, of course, the lipopolysaccharide on um, on uh, bacteria, but the molecules in breast milk uh, share mimicry with it, and so very quickly. We screen breast milk for compounds that can interact with TLR4, and we validate our hits from in silico studies based on compounds in breast milk. And so we use that approach both as discovery and as validation, because if it's in breast milk, it's got to have a good safety profile. And and have you looked at it in um, in animals, um, giving that breast milk? Because I I've, I've, was very interested in learning that formula induces neck, whereas breast milk uses as a as a control. Yes. Have, have you looked for that? Yeah. So we've obtained breast milk from mice, from pigs. So we milk the mice. We have a little mouse uh, feed, uh, uh, pumping device, and pigs uh, from pregnant sows, which we do under an anesthetic. You'll be pleased to know. And so, um, uh, and they had they share these properties, and these are TLR4 antagonists, and that speaks both to the uh, how old TLR4 is as a molecule, and how mm -hmm. universal breast milk is for mammals as an anti-inflammatory. It's really a very exciting area of science. Absolutely, thank you so much, David. Uh, maybe a, a time for a quick final question. So I know you've you've. Um, um, we're fortunate to receive continuous funding through through the NIH and and, and other federal agencies. Maybe you can uh, briefly share your experience with funding through sure. MSCRF and how it's different from the other funding agencies. Yeah, there's nothing like it, and we wouldn't be able to do the uh, any of these projects, both the uh, the Gene Pathway Project and the Amniotic Fluid Project, without the MSCRF. It's um, uh, too high risk for the NIH, quite frankly, uh, and it's too, and we've tried, believe me, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's almost too close to potential therapeutic. It's discovery, but it's very focused, and so it's both too high risk and too single disease focused for the NIH to really either buy the significance and also uh, to be willing to take the risk. That's the most obvious thing. But the other part of MSCRF is the community that we are part of, of MSCRF discovery uh, grantees. The feedback we get during the granting process, the reviewer comments are always by people that are in this field and they get it. And that's not a hit against the NIH as an NIH reviewer. But this is uh, the only agency I think that that uh, would be interested or, or has shown an interest in the MSCRF and we're very grateful for it. Well, thank you very much. We are very grateful for your kind words. And again, very impressed by, by your work. Thank you very much for your time, David. Thank you. A pleasure to be here. Take care. Thank you. So let me put my cheat sheet up. And I'm going to start um, the timer. We have overall 25 minutes, OK? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I've tried to do this in 20 minutes. We'll see if I succeed. <laughs> it's fine if it's not. Again, that's it's no problem. 
Okay. I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Elias Zimbidas. Dr. Zimbidas is a professor of oncology and pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Zimbidas' laboratory focuses on understanding human developmental biology with the long-term goal of understanding the biological mechanism that regulate the differentiation of human pluripotent stem cells. As a physician scientist, Dr. Zambidis is highly recognized for his contribution to the Johns Hopkins Pediatric Bone Marrow Transplant, tra Transplant Program. Dr. Zambidis both serves on the editorial board and is a peer reviewer for numerous international journals, as well as federal research grant committees such as the NIH and BUD. Dr. Zambidis has also been recognized for his leadership and public advocacy of supporting research funding for human stem cell research, particularly using pluripotent stem cells. Next, we'll hear more from Dr. Zimbidis about his work, most recently funded through the MSCRF Validation Program. The title of his talk is Commercial Validation of Clinical Grade Progenitors from TIRN Turn Human Induced Pluripotent Stem Cells. Elias, welcome. Ben, thank you very much for this opportunity to um, discuss some of my group's work, um, and in particular that which is funded by the Maryland Stem Cell Research um, Fund. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about today uh, some of the ongoing work that, that we have, and uh, thank you again for that introduction. My lab, as you mentioned, um, combines research in human developmental and stem cell biology, uh, and as well as our clinical expertise in pediatric bone marrow transplantation, we focus on developing um, stem and organ transplantation therapies. Uh, most of you are familiar with the revolution of human-induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, they're mortal cell lines that are patient-specific cell lines. They can really produce any tissue in the body. And one of the beautiful things about MSCRF is um, an approach uh, towards taking technology from the bench, not only into the clinic, but into the market. And so there are a lot of opportunities for IPSC um, for not only replacing damaged tissue, but potentially forming uh, anti-cancer therapies uh, as well as drug screening um, approaches. Um, my lab uh, many years ago uh, came onto the scene for uh, efficiently um, reprogramming CD34 positive blood progenitors um, and, and uh, demonstrating that we can differentiate them into multiple tissues for transplantation and regenerative medicine. These are some of the, the sample representative publications that we've had using the Zambitis Lab um, cord blood uh, iPSC. Um, our cells are uh, commercially available. These um, cord blood iPSC that we've developed um, can be um, purchased from uh, Thermo Fisher Gibco, and we have at least um, six or seven lines that you can purchase uh, through Ycell. Um, they're uh, very high quality, uh, very high efficiency in differentiating, um, and they've also been used in consortia, uh, such as the, the, the publication here, uh, and compared to many other IPSC that have been derived from uh, laboratories around um, uh, the country and the world. Um, many of the, the problems that my lab has tackled have been basically to create better stem cells. There are many limitations to current conventional and also these new naive epiblast-like iPSCs. And um, primarily, uh, the current technology is plagued by genomic instability, um, epigenetic memory of the, the donor um, cell type that they come from, and many uh, conventional iPSC are so-called lineage primed. Um, they're already mesendoderm differentiated and uh, sometimes lose their um, efficiency towards the desired differentiation lineage. Um, so uh, in addition, some of these new naive um, iPSC and HSC that have been developed have had poor ability to um, generate interspe interspecies chimeras. So um, some of the basic questions that we ask is, can we abolish the interline variability of current conventional iPSC? And ultimately, can we derive adult stage transplantable tissues? We've been very much invested into the search for a more versatile human pluripotent stem cell. And we've, um, we've gone 
backwards towards the left side of the developmental stage, possibly even trying to derive totipotent stem cells, uh, where one cell can create the entire organism um, for regenerative medicine and possibly be used for more efficient interspecies um, chimer chimerism. So the method that we have developed, we first published in 2015, uh, we published a small molecule-based um, approach for creating human naive epiblast-like stem cells, and we reverted conventional primed iPSC to um, what we call a tankerase PARP inhibitor regulated naive uh, system. So it's a long, uh, long series of words that we just um, abbreviate by calling them TURN, also known as the LIF3I system. And essentially what we're doing is we're using three um, inhibitors. We use the classic naive reversion cocktail of MEK inhibition and JS, uh, GSK3 beta inhibition. And we add a nonspecific PARP inhibitor called ZAB939. And we do it in such a way um, that we get stable reversion, chemical reversion to a naive epiblast stem cell state. Um, the, uh, the original paper is, uh, is online and the details of the derivation have also been uh, uh, republished in various um, um, protocol uh, chapters. Um, uh, but the interesting thing is the, the PARP inhibitor um, has really opened up a, a brand new avenue of stem cell biological mechanism for my lab. Uh, it's, this, this particular promiscuous nonspecific PARP inhibitor um, actually affects multiple um, uh, PARPs, which regulate um, the proteome. So I'm not going to get too much into, into the biology of PAR, which is uh, poly ADP ribosylation, but it's a key post translational modification that regulates proteomic and genomic stability. I don't have time today to go really into all the details of the mechanism, but needless to say, my lab is currently now heavily invested in trying to understand the role of this post-translational modification on the role of development and also potentially on the role of generating more primitive um, totipotent stem cells. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this uh, turn system because it's really a really cool and interesting story. So one of the things that we found is that these naive epiblast-like stem cells uh, were not only in a more primitive state, but they actually differentiate to multiple lineage with extremely high efficiencies, more efficient than um, uh, prime conventional stem cells. And sort of uh, uh, the story started there and the race was off. Um, you can take a variety of different iPSC or human embryonic stem cells and whether you're differentiating them um, to the neural lineage or to the endoderm lineage or to the mesoderm lineage, they're, um, they have less lineage priming. They're more pure in their primitive embryonic stem cell state. And you can take a, um, a lineage prime conventional cell and pretty much erase its epigenetic memory with it. So this immediately should spark the idea that these um, naive epiblast-like cells may actually have some market value. And so we've also, through the auspices of the uh, MSCRF, have tried to capitalize on creating better stem cells um, for regenerative medicine. We have basically stem cells that abolish epigenetic memory, yet conserve their, their genomic imprinting and stability with a lot of other naive uh, uh, reversion methods seem to lose. And that's actually something we're really heavily studying on. Why is that? And what does PARP have anything to do with it? And they have very robust multi-lineage potential without lineage priming. And so our first application to see if we can create better transplantable tissues from these improved turned stem cells brought us back to one of our papers that we published years ago in circulation, where we um, we took our core blood derived iPSC and we were able to generate vascular endothelial parasitic progenitors, which we call VP. These are essentially um, embryonic like vascular progenitors, which um, uh, they, they have endothelial characteristics and also mesenchymal characteristics. Um, they can form vascular cells in vivo and vascular tubes in vivo. Now, interestingly, when you try to create these vascular progenitors from these improved turn cells, um, all aspects of vascular mesoderm are, are um, dramatically improved in their differentiation efficiency. So 
this um, uh, this summary figure where uh, blue are uh, are primed differentiated iPSC and red are the turn reverted ones shows you that you can make more CD31 positive cells, more vascular progenitors that are CD31, 146 positive, more KDR mesoderm, more CD34, and uh, more um, endothelial cell phenotypes uh, in general. Higher percentage of differentiation, greater numbers um, are formed with these um, uh, cells. So in that previous uh, paper, we also developed an in vivo model for ischemic diabetic retinopathy, where we used ischemic reperfusion into uh, nog skid mice, immunodeficient mice, uh, and uh, were able to create a humanized model of vascular damage of the eye that we could inject vascular progenitors into. We published the results um, in a paper several years ago in NatureCom. And what we found is that when we created these vascular progenitors, um, they not only had increased in vitro capacity, but also in vivo. Our chemical naive reprogramming of conventional iPSC with this PARP system um, erased epigenetic memory of both normal and diabetic iPSC, um, and uh, these uh, progenitors lasted longer in vivo and grafted better and produced more functional vascular regeneration. Um, I'll leave you to read the paper for the details, but here you can see an example of this improved in vivo efficacy where we have basically a chimerism between mouse vascular cells and the human vascular progenitors within the six layers of the human retina. They home to the retina, they found the areas of vascular degeneration, and they repaired them with extremely high efficiency. We were not able to see such high efficiency with vascular progenitors uh, produced by conventional primed uh, pluripotent stem cells. So we kept going and we tried to differentiate other types of lineages. And one of the things that we've done is um, we have a retinal organoid differentiation system. And we found that um, we could make little um, retinal cups in a dish and um, such cups generally do not engraft very well in immune deficient mice if you inject them within the subretinal space. But um, amazingly, the ones that came from um, these turn iPSC could be found in grafting and uh, forming uh, rods and cones up to 10 months post-retinal uh, mouse transplantation. So you can maybe see in your mind um, a lot of um, potential for a a bunch of different kinds of tissues that could potentially be marketed uh, for regenerative medicine um, it, it, for various indications, for visioning threatening diabetic retinopathy, for um, ischemic optic neuropathy, for macular degeneration, and for myocardial uh, infarction. If you could um, um, isolate both um, better performing vascular progenitors from these improved cells, as well as possibly photoreceptors, you could possibly co-transplant multiple lineages at the same time. So um, through the auspices of the current funding that we have, we decided to take it to the next step. The previous um, system that I showed you um, created iPSC and HESC within mouse feeders. In order for us to take this to a clinical and commercial level, we needed to make it um, CGMP ready. Um, current good manufacturing practice ready, and we had to make it xeno-free and feeder-free. So through the auspices of this current funding, we were able to modify all our ingredients to be xeno-free and feeder-free, and we were able to create this PARP-inhibited uh, system in a completely feeder-free, and we also were able to reprogram cord blood cells completely xeno-free and feeder-free. Obviously, more tweaks will have to be made um, uh, if this were ever to get an IND and try to become approved by the FDA. Um, furthermore, through the auspices of this uh, MSCRF grant, we were able to show, uh, this is sort of a summary update, this is not published data yet, but um, we were able to show that these xeno-free and feeder-free turn stem cells make beautiful vascular cells uh, in vitro. We're currently um, trying to set up experiments to inject them in vivo, just like the previous experiments that we showed you that were made with vascular progenitors um, on, on mouse feeders. And um, this is actually fresh off 
uh, hot off the press, also unpublished, um, we're actually be able to make very efficiently differentiated hematopoietic cells. Um, our hope is that future funding will allow us to create car cellular therapies with these um, hematopoietic cells. You could make neutrophils, you could make macrophages, and you can make T cells, both cytotoxic and NK cells, for the purposes of um, car cellular therapies. It's very exciting for us. So, the second problem that we propose in this current funding and that we would be seeking um, uh, more um, um, experiments uh, in the future is one of the essential problems of IPSC technology is the limitation of the autologous approach. This is really sort of the current paradigm. You make patient-specific IPSC, but it's a costly um, process um, that can take a really long time and the uh, methods um, that are made are usually uh, inefficient and you have to screen multiple different lines per patient. Um, the current methods for IPC generation also show genomic instability and lineage priming that may compromise the reprogramming efficiency. And I already addressed that we could get rid of this by reverting them chemically to the turn system. But we propose something beyond that. We propose a universal donor um, IPSC system where a shelf, a bank of different universal donor turn IPSCs could be used for multiple regenerative uh, medicine approaches. And you could uh, even create an HLA-defined IPSC bank um, and uh, address the um, HLA match donors uh, that may get immune rejection by methods of tolerance induction. How do you do that? Well, as a bone marrow transplant physician here at Hopkins, um, we have actually really revolutionized the field in uh, tissue transplantation by doing haploidentical bone marrow transplants using the post-transplant cytoxan method. And this is a little summary. Um, you, can, you can read the beautiful review article by Luznik et al. But um, we are able to induce um, immune tolerance um, in um, half-matched bone marrow transplants using this post-transplant cytoxan method, which depletes um, uh, rejecting T cells while preserving naive T cells um, that enhance engraftment and tolerance. We propose that we would make a U-turn IPSC haplobank of various HLA um, um, matched um, stem cell lines and uh, bank them uh, under uh, GMP grade conditions, create HLA matched donor cells and use the post-transplant method of tissue transplantation. Uh, we have several patents to these uh, approaches um, and we're currently uh, in a conversation with both Orgenesis and AstraZeneca for licensing some of this technology. We have uh, one patent which is currently pending, uh, which is basically the, um, the, the turn embryonic vascular progenitor cells. Uh, this will hopefully, um, the process of, of patent pending will uh, hopefully be done. It was um, uh, submitted several years ago. And we also have um, a patent uh, pending for using the HLA-defined U-turn IPSC banks. So we think that this has potentially great translational potential. And our ultimate goal is to um, set up various phase one trials in collaboration with um, uh, some biotechnology partners or perhaps our own, um, our own startup. And um, in addition to creating vascular progenitor therapies for diabetes, stroke, and myocardial infarction, other, other conversations we're having with biotechnology companies include uh, generating uh, CAR neutrophils, CAR macrophages, or CAR T cells using this improved turn stem cell technology, possibly using them for gene delivery or stem cell engineering, or even off-the-shelf infusible blood products such as granulocytes and platelets. I want to talk to you about something that um, is not published yet and that we're preparing um, uh, to tell uh, folks about, and that is, and I'll go ahead and give you guys a little sneak preview. Um, and, and we had a, um, a, a perspective paper published in Nature Regenerative Medicine, but it turns out that these turn stem cells have a very high potency for human animal intraspecific, intraspecific um, chimera formation. And our um, one of our ultimate goals is to use these improved turn stem cells to generate whole organs within um, farm animals. 
And um, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about um, how we intend to do that, you can you can read the review article. Um, that's the end of this presentation. I want to thank um, the many members of my lab that um, have been responsible uh, for some of these um, uh, innovations, in particular, Dr. Ludovic Zimmerlin and Dr. Taysun Park and many, many others, especially collaborators uh, at the Wilmer Eye Institute and some of our other collaborators at the medical school, in, in, including Dr. Anthony Long. I'll end it there, Ben, and I'll leave it open for questions if you have any. Wonderful. Thank you so much for a great talk, Elias. I appreciate the story. Um, and uh, very appreciative of the kind words uh, about uh, MSCRF. Um, maybe I'll start with, uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for a few questions. I'll start with the general kind of question. I know you're really a leader in, um, in um, um, pluripotent stem cells and you work with both induced pluripotent stem cells and embryonic stem cells. Uh, maybe you can share some of your insights on the kind of the advantages, disadvantages, and your perspective on, on using each each of those um, cell types. Well, so there are several things I can say uh, to that. Um, of course, the most important advantage of induced pluripotent stem cells is it bypasses many of the um, controversies associated with making human embryonic stem cells from IVF derived embryos. And so this was, you know, Yamanaka's uh, uh, great innovation and the reason why he won the Nobel Prize um, for it. Um, and so IPSC, I think ultimately um, have surpassed human embryonic stem cells and the regenerative um, uh, potential uh, and, and, and ability to license and to be used in clinical trials. Um, and, and just, you know, in regards to challenges in consent, donor consent. So, so I think IPSC are more um, feasible for use in regenerative medicine, and that's probably the greatest advantage. So some of the um, other advantages of these turn stem cells um, uh, that I already alluded to and summarized are that it bypasses some of the other, pr the, the major problems that many IPSC and HESC too have. And that is that number one, um, the, the differentiated progeny that you get from typical IPSC, um, is inefficient, uh, it, in vivo, many of the cells are sort of pro-apoptotic and they don't last very long, I think. I think some of um, the um, the NK cell cars um, that some biotech companies out there have recently reported uh, have noted that the, the cells don't last very long in vivo. I hope you're um, excited about the, the longevity of the cells from our vascular progenitors in vivo. Um, these cells tend to have less uh, apoptotic tendency. They're uh, they have a higher proliferative capacity, higher in KI67. Um, they, they proliferate faster, more robustly, and with greater vigor. Um, so I, I think a, IPSC in general have a, an advantage over HESC. And I think these turn H IPSC in particular are going to be uh, better suited for regenerative uh, applications. That's a great, great answer. Thank you so much, Elias. Um, so you you shared really a lot of information, and uh, maybe I can uh, just focus on the um, one of my questions because it was very interesting to learn more about the vascular progenitors from those turn cells. And you you've mentioned some um, implantation studies in newt skid mice um, and potentially other applications. Um, and maybe you can um, elaborate a, a bit more on that um, in terms of what other applications um, you, you would uh, envision these cells going into. And then maybe maybe more generally, not just the vascular progenitors, but maybe your turn cells in, in general, uh, what are those kind of the, the, the key diseases that you would like to explore first? So in these cells can be used for any application. There, there. It's a what you call, I guess, an enabling technology. So you know, um, you could, in theory, um, license it to anyone who wants to make any kind of tissue. These these turn stem cells differentiate better than conventional iPSC. Um, they they proliferate faster, um, so you can create larger numbers, and they um, they produce 
progenitors that last longer in vivo. So um, we can't do it all, obviously. So we're going to focus on only a couple of applications. So the the what my lab is going to focus on, I guess you could say in the next couple of years, is number one, um, vascular therapies. So that would be diabetic retinopathy and stroke. I think those are probably the two that we're probably going to be interested in, in focusing on. You could certainly potentially even use them for myocardial infarction, but you know, it's, it's probably more complicated and probably better done by cardiology labs, but, uh, definitely, um, uh, retinopathy and stroke and our animal models are suited to test those particular diseases. That's number one. Number two, I'm gonna list three things. So that was number one. Number two, number two, we are very much interested in creating um, uh, infusible um, uh, cells uh, for, for application in oncology, platelets, granulocytes, and specifically um, th th these cells that we can make very efficiently in vitro could be in, uh, inserted with certain genes that may have chimeric antigen receptor ca uh, capacities. You could put them in a neutrophil, you could put them in a, a macrophage, you could even generate um, a T cell. Um, so we're very much interested in pursuing that avenue. Now the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate dream goal uh, is as I mentioned at the end of my talk, these cells have an incredible capacity. I didn't show any of that data and hopefully you will see it by the end of the year. These have an incredible capacity to form inter interspecies chimerism uh, within uh, animals. In particular, all we've tested right now is mice. Um, you can create human tissues within animals very efficiently with these cells. It's actually a pretty elaborate and fascinating mechanism that we will hopefully describe. But what we hope as a number three is to create human stem cells or even human tissues like beta islet cells or heart cells or neural cells within the context of an in vivo developing uh, organism. So that'll probably be the third thing. And that's more like, you know, the three to five year plan. So um, if we can also create stem cell banks, um, that, that could potentially also be commercialized and used by other investigators for their um, tissue of interest. So lots of different applications, but we're going to focus on those three. Uh, that's uh, that's a great answer. Thank you so much, Elias. Um, you, you really answered my, my next question, really, on, on, on your vision and, and steps forward. So I, I appreciate that. I think generating a universal IPSC bank is, is really infinite uh, possibilities. So I'm very excited, um, you know, that MCRF is, is part of that. And, um, and, and I think um, maybe a, a quick quish question since we're kind of uh, due to time constraint out of time, um, maybe you can share some of your, um, some of your story as, as you have alluded to um, about MCRF, um, you know, I know you've, uh, um, had uh, a discovery award with us, and now you're um, doing the validation award. And you've mentioned you want to go into uh, clinical trials, which uh, MCRF would be uh, very happy to be a part of. Maybe you can um, share with the audience uh, perhaps your story uh, briefly or or some insight to young investigators. I'd love to. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to do that. So, um, there, there are so many strengths to the funding uh, given by the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund, especially now that they're focusing on discovery, commercialization, and clinical trials. So some of the things that we've been able to do, um, including uh, generating our own HESC lines, our own IPSC lines, and even some of the uh, interspecies chimera work that we've done simply cannot be funded by NIH money. And so we've been able to do this groundbreaking work through really the MSCRF as well as um, foundation money. Uh, with, without, without this funding, um, I think certain areas of research are simply just not fun, uh, fundable or feasible, that's first. Secondly, my own experience as a pediatric bone marrow transplantation uh, a clinician allows me to sort of think about problems in a way where um, you know, I can think about cellular therapies, how to improve them, and how to uh, translate them towards what is really the next step of cellular therapies, and that's using pluripotent stem cells. So we we have improved 
bone marrow transplantation therapies. That's the now, that's the current. The future is to create um, therapies for regenerating brain and pancreas and heart. And that's the future. And many of the, um, the motifs, the algorithms and the preps that we currently use for bone marrow transplantation, also peripheral blood stem cell transplantation, I believe are going to be translated to the new cellular transplantation. So sort of being at the interface of both clinical work and, and basic stem cell biology allows me to see that the steps are really not that far. They're not that far. It just requires um, an expertise and an insight to marry them together. So I think that well, one of the, the major goals which the MSCRF can definitely help in is how do we make current bone marrow transplantation preps safer um, without, without complications such as graft versus host disease uh, with tolerance induction using methods such as the post-transplant cytoxan approach? How do we take that clinical stuff that we're doing and make it better and safer. Why? Because once you you make bone marrow transplantation safer um, and with less complications, then that chasm between the pluripotent stem cell technologies is really a small one to jump because you don't want to do caustic uh, bone marrow transplants uh, and then you know try to um, if you want to get away from the autologous model. You want you want regimens that are easy, safe. Uh, inexpensive potentially, because, you know, some insurance is going to have to cover this. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, the clinician who is a stem cell transplant clinician is is probably very well suited um, to take this pluripotent stem cell technology to the next step. The MSCRF provides avenues uh, to do that because they provide avenues to do research that can't otherwise be funded. They provide avenues to fund clinical research trials and potentially commercialize some of it. So the MSCRF is really in a position that actually I don't think the NIH is in a position to do. You know, they really, um, uh, since its inception, um, have always been about bringing um, stem cell technologies to the clinic and commercializing them for the benefit of our patients and for the state of Maryland. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elias, again, for your kind words. Um, I would love to uh, to chat more. We're kind of out of time. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And, and I look forward to uh, continually working with you and uh, with the help of... Uh, MSCRF and your team. Thank you so much, Elias. Thank you, Ben. The, the pleasure and the honor was all mine. Okay. I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Jill Farner. Dr. Farner is an assistant professor and the director of the Multidisciplinary Epigenetics and Chromatin Clinicals Departments of Genetic Medicine and Pediatrics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Farner is a physician scientist with a long-standing interest in epigenetic mechanism of disease. Her laboratory research is focused on understanding disease mechanism and developing therapies for select Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery, also called chromatinopathies. Dr. Farner recently de delineated the first neurodevelopmental disorder of DNA methylation machinery, termed Backferner syndrome, which she will discuss today. Dr. Farner is a longstanding member of the American Society of Human Genetics and currently serves on its program committee. Dr. Farner is a recipient of numerous awards, including, but certainly not limited, to the prestigious Hartwell Foundation Individual Biomedical Research Award. Next, we'll hear more from Dr. Farner about her work on the back Farner syndrome funded through the MSCRF launch program. The title of her talk is Development of Patient iPSC-Derived Organoid Models for Beck-Ferner Syndrome, Probing DNA Methylation and Advancing Treatment. Jill, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak and for that kind introduction. So we'll get started. No conflicts of interest. So. Every cell in the body contains the same genetic material. However, cells must do different things at various times in development and in various tissues. 
Epigenetics plays a key role in this. Epigenetic or chromatin marks are heritable modifications of DNA or associated histones that do not alter the DNA sequence and determine whether genes are expressed or silenced. They add to the information content of the DNA by contributing to cell type specific patterns. I like to think of epigenetics as the genome's highlighter. In essence, epigenetic marks highlight certain genes to be expressed or silenced appropriately so that our one genome can be utilized differently at various times in development and in various tissues. For example, green genes might only be expressed in brain, red might only be expressed in heart, and blue might only be expressed in bone. In addition, they are malleable and affected by the environment and disrupted in many disease states, which has implications for therapeutic development. One such group of diseases are the Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery or chromatinopathies. These are a rapidly emerging group and the 70 genes responsible for these conditions are shown in the wheel and are divided into categories based on whether they encode enzymatic writers of epigenetic and chromatin marks, enzymatic erasers of these marks, non-enzymatic readers that interpret the marks, or chromatin remodeling enzymes which actively alter chromatin structure. This group of genes is highly dosage sensitive and when all genes are considered, about 80% have a PLI score of greater than 0.9. They're mostly autosomal dominant conditions, and the A shown here indicates autosomal, and the filled black circle around the periphery indicates dominant. They most occur through de novo mutations with a mechanism of haploinsufficiency. The most common phenotypic features of these disorders are intellectual disability and growth abnormalities. Intellectual disability is indicated by blue shading around the periphery and growth abnormalities are indicated with orange shading. These two features often co-occur. In addition to these most common features, there are many additional tissue diverse manifestations. And Remember, these are germline mutations in genes encoding components of the epigenetic machinery. So these genetic disorders have genome-wide epigenetic consequences. In the normal state, various components of the epigenetic machinery work together to allow some genes in the genome to be expressed and others to be silenced. In the normal situation, when all components of the epigenetic machinery are functioning properly, Gene one is expressed, and it is surrounded by writers of activating marks, erasers of silencing marks, readers of these marks, and chromatin remodelers. The net effect is an open chromatin state in active gene expression. Gene two is normally silenced. It is surrounded by distinct epigenetic machinery components, including writers of silencing marks, erasers of activating marks, and readers of these marks. And the net effect is a closed chromatin state and gene silencing. In the setting of a Mendelian disorder of the epigenetic machinery, when one component of the epigenetic machinery is not functioning properly, the writer of the activating mark here cannot place its activating mark and recruit the other components of the epigenetic machinery to gene one as it should. Thus, you have aberrant epigenetic machinery components, aberrant epigenetic marks, an abnormal chromatin state, and abnormal gene silencing. The indirect effect at gene two is that this gene, which is normally silenced, is abnormally expressed because the epigenetic machinery components that should be silencing this gene are mislocalized. This prevents them from placing their silencing marks and setting up the proper chromatin state, leading to an aberrant chromatin state and abnormal gene activation indirectly. This happens at many genes throughout the genome, causing broad epigenomic changes. Compared to the histone post-translational modification system, fewer disorders impact the DNA methylation system, and those that do are shown by the red outline. We recently elucidated the first neurodevelopmental disorder of the DNA demethylation machinery, initially called TET3 deficiency, and now also referred to as Beck-Farner syndrome. DNA methylation, or 5-methylcytosine, is the quintessential epigenetic mark. 
Classically, it occurs at cytosines followed by guanines or CPG dinucleotides. The writers of this mark are the DNA methyltransferases, and the TET enzymes are the erasers of 5-methylcytosine, and they catalyze the first steps of active DNA demethylation. The TET family of dioxygenases oxidizes 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, and then on through a series of additional intermediates, which are removed and replaced with an unmethylated cytosine, completing the process of active DNA demethylation. Now I will share with you the story of how we elucidated TET3 deficiency or Beck-Farner syndrome. Using exome sequencing and Gene Matcher, which is a matchmaking service for geneticists with patients with rare diseases, we identified 11 individuals from eight families with variants in one of the TET enzymes, TET3, which is important in embryological development and neuronal functioning. Affected individuals from families one through three had biallelic variants inherited in trans from carrier parents, consistent with autosomal recessive inheritance, though one or both parents in each family had milder manifestations. Affected individuals from families four through eight had monoallelic variants, and all of these occurred de novo, with the exception of family seven, in which the proband inherited the variant from a similarly affected father. Affected individuals had highly similar phenotypes, which were consistent with other disorders within the group. All had global developmental delay and or intellectual disability. A subset had growth abnormalities, hypotonia or low muscle tone, autism spectrum disorder or features of autism, movement disorders, and seizures and or EEG abnormalities. So as you can see, this is mostly a neurological phenotype. Affected individuals also shared distinct craniofacial features, including tall and or broad foreheads, brachycephaly or flattening of the back of the head, long hypotonic facies, and protruding ears. TET3 variants identified in the affected individuals are novel or rare. Here, monoallelic variants are shown in purple and biallelic variants are shown in orange. In our original paper, missense variants were mono or biallelic and occurred within the catalytic domain and frameshift variants occurred throughout the coding region, but were only monoallelic. Underlying variants occur in the last exon, exon, and the italicized orange variant is no longer thought to be pathogenic. In collaboration with Roberto Bonazio's group at the University of Pennsylvania, we performed functional studies to test the catalytic activity of a subset of the variants using an in vitro TET activity assay. Briefly, TET3 variants or controls were overexpressed in HEC293 cells, and the ability to convert 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, the first step of DNA demethylation, was measured using an antibody specific to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine on dot blot assays. 5-hydroxymethylcytosine levels were measured in cells expressing each of five TET3 variants and compared to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine levels in cells expressing wild type. TET3, and a catalytic dead control was, is located in the last lane of each blot. Quantification revealed that all variants tested showed reduced catalytic activity similar to the catalytic dead control, with the exception of one, that arginine 752 cysteine variant that I pointed out, which is outside the catalytic domain and not conserved among TET enzymes. These data show that most TET3 variants exhibit hypomorphic activity in vitro and suggest that the disease mechanism is due to reduced TET enzyme activity. We wanted to determine if deficiency of TET3 was associated with a genome-wide DNA methylation profile. And we know that many Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery have specific genome-wide DNA methylation profiles or epi-signatures in blood. In healthy individuals, gene A might be fully methylated, shown by the pink lollipops, gene D might be fully unmethylated, shown by the gray lollipops, and genes B and C might be partially methylated. And this would be the reference DNA methylation signature associated with healthy individuals. In syndrome A, when a particular component of the epigenetic machinery is not functioning properly, gene A might be fully unmethylated, gene D might be fully methylated, and genes B and C methylation status may not change. And this would be epi-signature A correlating with syndrome A. For syndrome B, if a distinct component of the epigenetic machinery is not functioning properly, then gene A might be fully unmethylated and gene B might be fully methylated, but gene C and D may not change. And this would be epi-signature B 
correlating with syndrome B, and so on and so forth. We hypothesize that deficiency of the TET3 eraser of DNA methylation would lead to an overall increase in DNA methylation and have a characteristic DNA methylation profile. We perform genome-wide DNA methylation profiling of whole blood from a discovery cohort consisting of three individuals with biallelic TET3 variants, three individuals with monoallelic TET3 variants, and five age and sex match controls for each affected individual. We used Illumina's Epic B chip array, which contains over 850,000 CPG probes, and subsequent analyses were performed in Beckham Sudokovic's lab. Hierarchical clustering analysis is shown, with each row representing an individual CPG site, each column representing an individual patient sample, with genotypes uh, color-coded, with green indicating controls, blue indicating individuals with biallelic TET3 variants, and red indicating individuals with monoallelic TET3 variants. The color scale from dark blue to dark red represents the DNA methylation level or beta value ranging from zero, unmethylated, to one, fully methylated. Hierarchical clustering reveals an overall increase in DNA methylation and clearly separates the TET3 samples shown in blue and red from controls shown in green, with the TET3 biallelic samples showing more of an increase in DNA methylation compared to the monoallelic samples. Multidimensional scaling, which is like principal components analysis, groups the samples based on similarity. And the multidimensional scaling clustered the samples into three groups with biallelic samples on the far left shown in blue, controls on the far right shown in green, and monoallelic TET3 samples in between shown in red. These data establish a DNA methylation signature for TET3 deficiency, which separates TET3 deficient samples from controls and can further distinguish individuals with monoallelic and biallelic variants. We validated the EPI signature using a distinct cohort consisting of individuals with known monoallelic pathogenic TET3 variants, unaffected family member controls without TET3 variants, and the benign missense variant that did not reduce catalytic activity in our in vitro assay. Here, the original discovery cohort samples are shown in faded colors, while the new validation samples are shown in bright colors. Multidimensional scaling reveals that all samples validated with the new monoallelic pathogenic TET3 variants clustering with the original monoallelic pathogenic TET3 variants in red, the new family member controls clustering with the age and sex matched controls shown in green, and the benign variant clustering between shown in yellow. We use these data to, to train a support vector machine to generate methylation variant pathogenicity prediction scores, or MVP scores, which are the probability that a particular variant has the TET3 epi, epi signature, or the probability that a particular variant is pathogenic. Our biallelic samples scored near one, whereas controls scored closer to zero. Our monoallelic pathogenic samples scored between 0.5 and 0.8, with the benign variant that didn't reduce catalytic activity in between. We then refined the TET3 epi signature using both the discovery and validation cohort samples and their matched controls shown in faded colors. We used the new signature to test a new cohort, the testing cohort, consisting of both biallelic and monoallelic TET3 variants of uncertain significance, which are shown here in orange and purple. Both biallelic samples shown in orange and the four monoallelic samples shown in purple and labeled 19, 20, 23, and 24 clustered with controls shown in green, indicating non-pathogenicity. The other four individuals with monoallelic variants of uncertain significance, 21, 22, 25, and 26, clustered with monoallelic pathogenic samples shown in light red, indicating pathogenicity. The sample shown in black is unique. All previous samples had identified DNA methylation sequence variants in TET3, and we performed these analyses to determine whether the sequence variants were pathogenic or benign. This sample, however, was initially not known to have a DNA sequence variant in TET3 and was identified based on the TET3 epi signature when the signature was used to screen a database of over 1,000 undiagnosed individuals. This variant clusters with our with other monoallelic pathogenic variants, suggesting a pathogenic variant in TET3 in this individual. 
and subsequent review of the individual's exome, prior exome sequencing analysis identified a monoallelic nonsense variant in TET3 inherited from a possibly mosaic mother, confirming the diagnosis and illustrating the robustness and diagnostic utility of the TET3 epi-signature. Methylation variant pathogenicity scores supported the other analyses with the two samples with biallelic uh, pathogenic, uh, sorry, biallelic variants shown in orange and the benign monoallelic samples 19, 20, 23, and 24 shown in purple having scores close to zero, suggesting they are benign and that the pathogenic monoallelic variants 21, 22, 25, and 26, and this one used in the screen have higher scores, mostly between 0.5 and 1, suggesting pathogenicity. The big question is how did our DNA methylation signature perform compared to other more traditional metrics used to classify variants? Remarkably, it correctly classified all variants if we compare the findings with the DNA methylation signature to those of other metrics shown in the box. We next wanted to determine whether the TET3 deficient epi signature would be able to distinguish Beck-Farner syndrome from other conditions with known epi signatures. Taking a one against all approach, we compared the TET3 samples to samples from 46 other neurodevelopmental disorders with 38 distinct epi signatures and controls. 75% of samples were used for training and 25% were used for testing, shown in blue and gray respectively. We found that the samples from controls and all other syndromes, with the exception of one, had scores near zero. This indicates the TET3 epi signature was able to differentiate individuals with pathogenic variants in TET3 from individuals with the other neurodevelopmental disorders, with one exception. And the exception is the disorder ADCADIN, or autosomal dominant cerebellar ataxia, deafness, and narcolepsy syndrome, caused by hypermorphic mutations in DNMT1, a writer of DNA methylation. MVP scores for ADCADIN partially overlapped those with Beck-Farner syndrome. We next directly compared methylation changes in samples from TET3 deficiency and DNMT1 mutations and their respective controls. Interestingly, hypomorphic mutations in the TET3 eraser of DNA methylation in Beck-Farner syndrome and hypermorphic mutations in the DNMT1 writer of DNA methylation in ADCADIN would both be expected to cause an overall increase in DNA methylation, which is what we observed in the hierarchical clustering. Compared to controls shown in green, samples with pathogenic TET3 variants shown in blue, red, and purple, and ADCADIN samples shown in black have an overall increase in DNA methylation. And the multidimensional scaling agrees and shows that ADCADIN and Beck-Farner syndrome samples cluster separately from one another and from controls, indicating unique epi signatures that can distinguish individuals with the two disorders. We next looked for clusters of differentially methylated CPGs to identify differentially methylated regions, or DMRs, that have the potential to be biologically significant. We compared six TET3 samples with both biallelic and monoallelic variants to a set of 30 unrelated age and sex matched controls. This identified 50 DMRs, all of which had an increase in DNA methylation in the TET3 deficient samples. Here we show the most statistically significant DMR, which was located at the transcription start site of TMEM204 and within an intron of IFT140. Vertical black lines indicate the position of the DMR, and we found that 20 DMR-associated genes, including this one, these two, uh, encode proteins whose function, if disrupted, would be predicted to lead to one or more phenotypic features of Beck-Farner syndrome. Overall, 90% of protein-coding transcripts associated with the differentially methylated regions were expressed in brain, according to the GTEx track in the UCSC browser. Because so many protein coding transcripts associated with these DMRs were expressed in brain, we looked more closely at what is known about expression of these DMR-associated genes in disease-relevant cell types. Using single-cell RNA-seq data from human fetal ex cerebral excitatory and inhibitory neurons published by Jay Shinduri's group in 2020, 
We found that in both excitatory and inhibitory neurons, the genes associated with the identified DMRs are expressed at significantly higher levels than other autosomal protein coding genes. And this is more pronounced in excitatory neurons. While it is unclear whether DMRs in whole blood reflect DNA methylation changes in the brain, the most disease relevant tissue, the observation that expression of the identified DMR-associated genes is significantly higher than other protein-coding genes in fetal neurons is intriguing, particularly because these DMRs are abnormally hypermethylated in blood of TET3 deficient individuals. If this hypermethylation is also present in neurons of the developing fetus, it could result in abnormal silencing of these genes, potentially contributing to the pathogenesis of Beck-Farner syndrome. To further identify DNA methylation changes relevant to disease and to improve our understanding of Beck-Farner syndrome disease pathogenesis, we need to study a cell type relevant to disease, in this case, neuronal lineage cells. We had exclusive access to these patients and the ability to generate induced pluripotent stem cells from patients through collaboration with New York Stem Cell Foundation. Being new to the stem cell field and with little preliminary data, I applied for and was awarded funding through the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund Launch Award Program. The Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund Launch Award may accelerate the translational timeline for Beck-Farner syndrome. It's notable that we just described the condition in 2020, we established the DNA methylation profile in 2021, and we now have funding to elucidate disease mechanisms and test therapies in human-induced pluripotent stem cell models with uh, our launch award. Simultaneously, we have other collaborations ongoing to establish outcome measures for subsequent clinical trials in this condition. And both of these will pave the way for clinical trials and potentially an approved treatment before 2030, which would be within 10 years of disease identification. Briefly, with our launch award, the way it works is we see our patients in the epigenetics and chromatin clinic at Johns Hopkins and confirm their Beck-Farner syndrome diagnosis. We then do deep neurological phenotyping and blood collection to isolate PBMCs. These PBMCs are then reprogrammed to generate induced pluripotent stem cells by the New York Stem Cell Foundation and isogenic controls as well. We, they then expand, characterize, and perform quality control assays on the iPSCs and controls, send them back to us, where we identify cellular disease mechanisms using patient iPSC-derived organoids. We then also determine DNA methylation and gene expression changes in neuronal cells and evaluate efficacy of targeted therapies, which we then hope to take back to our clinic and our patients. So in summary, the Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery are a rapidly growing group of conditions due to germline mutations in epigenetic machinery and chromatin modifier genes. Beck-Farner syndrome is a new Mendelian disorder of the epigenetic machinery implicating the DNA demethylation eraser system. It is characterized by the following features, behavioral differences, epilepsy, facial fe characteristic facial features, autistic features, hypotonia, retardation of psychomotor development, and size differences. Based on functional studies and genome-wide DNA methylation analysis, the disease mechanism likely involves reduced TET activity. Beck-Farner syndrome has a highly sensitive and specific genome-wide DNA hypermethylation profile that is important diagnostically, but the disease relevance is unclear. The Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund Launch Award will, pro will improve our understanding of this condition and of DNA methylation in the human brain in general and help to identify targeted therapies. And I'd like to acknowledge all of our collaborators and especially the patients and their families, as well as our funding sources, in particular, the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund Launch Award Program. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jill, for a very educational talk. I appreciate that. Learned a lot. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll jump into some uh, straight into some questions. And the uh, seeing that some individuals, uh, the Beck-Ferner syndrome, present more broadly 
uh, with uh, intellectual disability and growth abnormality. I was wondering if you know um, how many go um, the undiagnosed or misdiagnosed? Yes, yeah, so I think many individuals with Beck-Farner syndrome are undiagnosed, um, especially because we just recently described this condition in um, 2020. Um, but we are learning more and more about these individuals. Uh, we do know from data more broadly on this group of disorders from our epigenetics and chromatin clinic that in our clinic, only about 27.5% of our patients are undiagnosed. Um, but that um, is a much, it's actually a much better number than what we know kind of um, in the country in general for genetics clinics and genetic syndromes in which more like 65 to 75% uh, percent are undiagnosed. Well, it's very high. Thank you so much, Jill. So the, um, maybe I, I follow up on, on that question. So the, once the diagnosis is made and the, the syndrome is confirmed, um, I, I, I believe there's no, uh, currently no line of treatment, but maybe you can share on the, on the clinical mm -hmm. care uh, for these patients. What, what, what do you do? Yes, for um, this particular condition, Beck-Farner syndrome, but also for other individuals with Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery, there are no approved targeted therapies. And so we treat these patients symptomatically. So for their developmental delay or intellectual disability, uh, we recommend developmental services, things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Um, we can start, treat some of the um, behavioral differences like ADHD with current medications that are used for the general population of individuals that have ADHD. Their anxiety can be treated um, using um, drugs that we use generally for anxiety treatment in other individuals, but we don't have targeted therapies um, for these conditions. But there is a lot of work um, ongoing um, in the lab and in the clinic to try to come up with these and to um, test these therapies in patients. So that's that's basically my, my next question. You're, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you can share briefly uh, some of the approaches, strategies that, that you know of, uh, therapeutic strategies that are currently under development um, that, that show promise in, in your expert opinion. And, and then maybe, um, you know, fo follow on to that, a compounded question. Um, do, do you think that those uh, maybe in the future um, can, can have the... Um, the, the capacity or the, the promise to to improve cognitive ability. Yes. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, these are genetic disorders that impact the epigenetic machinery and have broad epigenomic consequences or changes in the epigenetic marks. Um, so for um, one related condition, uh, one of the other Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery called Kabuki syndrome, um, my colleagues here at Johns Hopkins um, have done preclinical trials in mice with epigenetic therapies that were initially developed to treat individuals with cancer. People may be familiar with histone deacetylase inhibitors or HDAC inhibitors. Um, and so they had published, and, and the idea would be then that for Kabuki syndrome, which is a deficiency of an activating mark, if you treat with these HDAC inhibitors, which inhibit the opposing, uh, some not the opposing component of the epigenetic machinery, but um, at the inhibit um, erasers of a silencing mark, you can sort of tip the chromatin state back toward the way that you want it. And that showed promise in mouse models of Kabuki syndrome um, and improved their learning and memory on um, certain uh, behavioral tests that are well um, studied in mice. Um, a similar dietary therapy that inhibits, that is that essentially leads to HDAC inhibition has also shown promise in mice um, with Kabuki syndrome and improved their learning and memory. And then a, a different um, 
therapy for um, that sort of targets the opposing component of the epigenetic machinery. So um, Kabuki syndrome one results from deficiency of the placement of a histone H3 lysine four methylation mark. If you inhibit the opposing eraser of that mark in mice, that also showed improvement in learning and memory in mice. And these were in young adult mice. Um, we have, um, our group has an ongoing um, sort of a clinical trial in individuals um, through our clinic um, that is currently really the only uh, clinical trial that I know of um, for these Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery. And so we are trying to move this along in both animal models and in humans. And good luck. Yeah. Thank that's, you. That sounds promising and wonderful. Um, so uh, maybe time for for one more question. So um, I would be interested in, in in learning more, and I'm sure the audience as well. Uh, you briefly touched on the uh, on your experimental design for the MSCRF launch uh, project and evaluate therapies in an organoid model. Uh, perhaps you can briefly highlight the 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 some targeted therapy approaches that you were thinking on, on, on trying and um, what would efficacious uh, would mean in, in your, um, in your world in, in terms of uh, maybe clinical outcome, but this is in vitro. So what, what would constitute um, efficacy in your organoid model? Sure. Um, so we are interested in um, generating um, cerebral forebrain organoids um, because we think that those would probably be the um, best um, type of organoid uh, be based on what we know about um, the, the disease pathogenesis in Beck-Farner syndrome. Um, and we have, so the um, TET enzymes have a cofactor of ascorbic acid or vitamin C. And so we think that by using that as a potential treatment, um, we might be able to augment the, um, the activity of that enzyme um, and use that as one approach to treat um, the organoids. Um, in addition, as, we, as I mentioned, this is an eraser of DNA methylation. So we also were thinking um, of trying a um, inhibition of writers of DNA methylation. So the DNA methyltransferases with DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, which um, again, were initially developed for cancer that have um, disruption in these marks, um, and also a combination therapy of those two things. Um, and we would be looking for um, you know, changes in the phenotype, um, the cellular phenotype in the organoids. Mm -hmm. um, so re reversal or improvement in any of those cellular phenotypes. In addition, because this does impact DNA methylation, and we know that patients with this condition do have disrupted DNA methylation, at least in blood, which is not a relevant tissue, but by making organoids from these, from cells from these patients and um, differentiating, the, differentiating them into neuronal lineage cells, we'll be able to study DNA methylation patterns in those cells at various stages of development, which will really help us better understand disease pathogenesis. And um, these therapies also, because in one case they target that particular um, uh, epigenetic mark. Uh, we think that that um, sort of reversal of these changes that we identify would suggest that the therapy is efficacious. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Jill. I uh, We're out of time, but I, I appreciate um, everything and I look forward to seeing the results of the projects and uh, hopefully moving you to a uh, clinical trial as, as you've mentioned. Thank you thank so you. much, Jill. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and uh, thank you again for the award. Absolutely. Take care. I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Banu Telugu. Dr. Telugu is a founding member, president, and chief scientific officer of Renovet Biosciences, a livestock genetic engineering company. Dr. Telugu is a trained veterinarian, is also an associate professor in the Division of Animal Sciences at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Primary research interests of his laboratory and company include genetic engineering of pig models for addressing critical priorities of biomedical research. 
Specifically, Dr. Telugu's laboratory employs advanced genome editing tools, such as CRISPR, for modifying the peak genome to develop novel models for cell and gene therapy applications. The company is also developing technologies to generate human liver in pigs to bridge critical shortfall in the availability of life-saving organs for transplantation. Next, we'll hear more from Dr. Tuluga about his work funded through the MSCRF Commercialization Award. The title of his talk is Personalized Human Organs for Transplantation, Meeting a Growing Unmet Need. Banu, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Ben, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this session. Um, as Dr. Ben has mentioned, our company is involved in uh, several genome editing technologies that allow us to utilize the pig model for cell and gene therapy research. Specific to this discussion, we're also working towards generating human liver using pig as a bioreactor. So to begin with, uh, why uh, generate livers? Um, the problem is that livers are in a, such a critical short supply. Uh, one in six patients that are waiting for life-saving liver transplant uh, die, waiting for the transplant to be received. And the solution that has been thought about for a while is the use of pigs as a models to generate uh, or modify the pigs for transplantation of the organs. So a solution that's unique to Renovate is that instead of using pig organs for transplantation, we are trying to generate human livers and pigs. So to begin with, we are starting with human pluripotent stem cells. In this case, we are using off-the-shelf patient de-identified stem cells. And we are then modifying the pig cells uh, to generate the critical mutations or ablate critical genes that would be required for hepatogenesis. And when these cells are used for generating pig embryos and the human stem cells are injected into the blastocyst, we occupy that we expect that in the resulting pig following embryo transfers, the donor stem cells will occupy the niche left vacant by the loss of HHGX or the liver cells and will be populated by the human cell. This is a survival selection, meaning that if there is no successful transplantation or there's no successful cameraization, the liver will not form and so the piglets will not survive. So any surviving piglets will carry the human hepatocytes in them. We want to then further take this and do in vivo testing before we get to the patient, uh, patient cohort. So the primary product focus as of now is generating human hepatocytes that could be, so we call this as an on-demand source of human hepatocytes. That could be leveraged for uh, several technologies, including 3D printing, generating organ and chip devices that could be used for pharmaceutical research, cell and therapy, uh, cell therapy applications. A uh, few of the companies in this space uh, probably familiar with is Metamatrix and Fatlib Bio. And using a pig as a whole holistic model with human liver can also allow us to use them for pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and other toxicological evaluation of the drugs. And in the distant future, we would also like to be in a position where we can take this with further modification of the pigs we are generating, that these livers could be compatible for whole organ transplantation as well. So we call them as bicompatible liver from pigs or blebs. The livers are, uh, or the opportunity is, is pretty huge. Uh, so we believe that the 12, currently 12,000 patients waiting on the solid organ transplant wait list and an estimated cost of half a billion dollars. Uh, this would be a $6 billion opportunity per year. And the same, uh, there is a huge uh, market opportunity for cell therapy research as well. Uh, we expect this to be about $3 billion opportunity per annum. The Renovate technology uh, differs from most of our competitors in that we believe that we will meet both the functionality as well as the immune compatibility um, aspects of these tra transplantable cells as well as livers, you know, resulting pigs. So to begin with, uh, we, we as I mentioned, we need to generate pigs that are deficient 
in the hepatogenesis where they cannot generate their human liver. So to achieve this, uh, again, going back to the pipeline, we started with porcine fetal fibroblast cells. We delivered CRISPR reagents into these cells to make these targeted modifications. But then we used the slaughterhouse oocytes, enucleate those uh, oocytes, and we introduced these cells with these targeted genetic modifications into the enucleated oocyte. When the cells are fused with the oocyte, it now becomes uh, a zygote and starts developing, and when transplanted into a surrogate animal, can generate pigs. We, in our laboratory, we see an average of four to six piglets being born uh, from one round of embryo transfer. Uh, to begin with, uh, we took a more finite approach. So instead of doing a global HHEX knockout, uh, we generated a gut-specific or more specifically a liver-specific knockout of HHEX. So to accomplish this, we tagged FOXA3 locus that is expressed in the gut and we are driving CRE from that particular gene. So this is the schematic of that. I'm not gonna go into too many details, but using CRISPRs and homologous recombination, we were able to introduce the CRE trans gene in frame with the splice acceptor site into the FOX3 locus. We were able to generate fetal lines from this FOX3 CRE, showing that it is not lethal by itself. And we also confirmed liver specific expression of the CRE in the resulting uh, fetal cells. Further to this, uh, we floxed HHEX, uh, which needs to be conditionally deleted. So we went with two uh, CRISPRs, flanked with XR1. This is the same strategy that has been employed in the MOS models. And the net goal is to replace the XR1 with the floxed exons. Uh, so that when CRE is available in the resulting gut cells or the liver cells, the floxing happens and the exon mode is deleted. So this is a phenotype of this conditional knockout mice. So on the left is a wild type uh, pig, you have pig fetus. You can see the proper development of liver. That is the heart. The somatogenesis is taking place and that's the mesonephrus. On the right, it's pretty evident that the liver is completely absent. So this confirms that the mutations that we have engineered has resulted in the loss of liver development in the fetuses. And this would serve as an ideal host for chimerism studies. And another further to this, you can see that the fetus development is severely retarded. And this has to do with the fact that liver plays a major role in hematopoiesis during early embryo development. So lack of liver development further reduces survival of the resulting fetus. We did confirm that these cells can be, when complemented with pluripotent cells, can re result in chimerism. And in that resulting fetuses, you can see that the entire liver is resulted from your donor-derived uh, cell. So in this case, we injected a GFP-labeled embryonic cell that would be equivalent of a pluripotent cell that we want to inject from the humans. And when chimerized and introduced, you can see a greater contribution of GFP, but more importantly, the GFP entire liver is coming from your GFP donor cell. Further to this, uh, we are currently embarking on testing the time resistance potential of the human pluripotent stem cells. Um, as most of you are familiar with, uh, the stem cells do exist in different pluripotent states, uh, ranging from prime state, which is where they like to be, um, and we also are pretty familiar with the fact that these prime state cells, they don't effectively chimerize when injected into human or mouse fetuses. Um, so we have been modifying these stem cell lines to make them more chimera competent. And one of this is actually making them transgenic to BCL2. So you can see here on the left, we established these transgenic cell lines that also include a GFP. So that allows us to track the injected stem cell lines in the embryos and fetuses. On the right is a, uh, a snapshot of a pig blastosis being injected with human pluripotent stem cells. And as evident here in the resulting fetuses, we saw very little to no chimerism to very high chimerism in the fetuses. So some of this could be uh, kind of misleading because GFP can be autofluorescent. Is autofluorescence in the fetuses is a concern. 
So we went ahead and did deep sequencing of these fetuses. So this is not an exhaustive list, but all the uh, summary of the results that we have attained so far. So you can see there are different stem cell lines that have expression of these different trans genes. And in the nutshell, what we're trying to do is make them more competent for camera competence. So this is based on literature that's out there. And these are uh, the summary of results. So we see that there is one stem cell line that is representative of the naive state that has close to one in thousand cells being, one thousand to three in thousand cells being camerized with these uh, fetuses, uh, fetuses being camerized. I think this would be a good starting cell line to uh, start camerizing our HHEX cell fetuses because even at, the, at this rate in one in thousand cells, we expect that in the absence of uh, competition by the deletion of HHEX, they will have a competitive advantage and uh, establish the liver cells. In addition to this, as we progress them towards uh, the goal of doing solid organ transplantation, um, besides the hepatocytes, these livers would carry somatic cells that would be of pig origin. So we need to basically generate additional modifications so that the resulting organ will not be rejected by the human host. So these would be candidates that uh, that uh, that fall into what we call as innate immunity. So that we have circulating preformed antibodies to several black oscillations that are present on the pig organs. So for example, alpha gal, beta gal, CMAH, and we have since went ahead and knocked out all these genes, so we can provide protection against the hyperacute rejection. We also have modified genes that would be required for acquired immunity protection from macrophages, and protection from complement cascade. We're in the process of making these strategies so that they can all be compatible for a coagulation, uh, go against the coagulation therapies, uh, work on the coagulation uh, problems, I have to say. Further to this, one of the major concerns is the presence of porcine endogenous retroviruses. Uh, as you're familiar with, one of the risks is that when you use an uh, exogenous host-derived uh, cell, these PERS or the endogenous retroviruses may be able to infect the human cells and actually cause mutagenesis. So to work on this, uh, we actually deployed base editors. The goal is to convert a C to a T and introduce a stop codon within a highly conserved region within a very critical gene called polyurase. So the expectation is that when we turn this into a stop codon, polyurase gene will not be expressed and the PER genes cannot be assembled hence transmitted to the human host. Um, and we actually went ahead and made, made the modifications, generated those fetus and cells, and then we had, had then confirmed the loss of PERS by doing both the uh, um, target amplicon sequencing as well as a whole genome sequencing. We identified two such feed, uh, animals, uh, F9 and F13, to be greater than 99% knockouts, with the rest of them having mutations that will render them inactive. As far as the future directions go, uh, we are, as I mentioned, we are doing uh, investigating the cameras of potential. This is essentially uh, the rate limiting step for this entire process. Uh, we are doing single cell RNA seq, so we're trying to identify the stem cell lines that not only cameras but also generate a population or in uh, liver that would be more appropriate for these studies. And we hope to going forward uh, deploy these technologies and accomplish the goal of complementation. And further to this, we are on the backdrop. We're working on generating these foundational genetic modifications to generate what we call as a xenopig that will allow us to compete not only in the liver space but also heart, lung, and other xenotransplantation market space as well. Um, this this is this kind of points towards our commercialization plan. Uh, we are funded by Maryland Stem Cell Fund uh, that allowed us to do some of these base modifications and preliminary work that I presented uh, in the in the talk today. Uh, we also have revenues coming from our uh, cell and gene therapy preclinical research work. We hope that with uh, additional funding. Uh, that we would be able to generate the critical uh, POC and go to uh, bring about a series A funding within 2024. We hope to then take it to a critical uh, uh, 
deflection point or inflection point where we show the functionality of the livers uh, within the uh, within the human patients. So for this, we are collaborating with the University of Southern California, who, uh, who have agreed to test the livers to uh, on a perfusion device to make sure that the livers are uh, when perfused with human blood, they overcome the immunological barriers, they are functional and secreting human proteins, and also they don't have any evidence of PERVs or any zoonotic potential. I think that would be a critical inflection point for us to embark on a series B funding round, but we also may consider a strategic exit at this point. Uh, as far as intellectual property goes, uh, we have uh, obtained license to use CRISPR from Catabo Biosciences. Uh, most of the foundational uh, patents that we have generated have been licensed while I have been generated in my academic lab while I was at University of Maryland and have since acquired an exclusive license back from the university. This is our core team. Uh, besides the management team, we have uh, four uh, employees uh, that are trained in embryology and stem cell biology, which is very important or fundamental to this. They have more than 50 years of research experience in this field. Um, that gives us a unique advantage to compete in this space. With that, i um, like to thank the group who are working diligently in Maryland, and also my academic group here at Missouri. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Manu. Very exciting talk. And uh, now there is, a, there is a huge need for transplantable organs. And using your Xenopig, this could be a, a real game changer. So uh, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll follow with some questions. Uh, we have some time. Um, so you talked about the, um, the opportunity to develop um, hepatocytes. And um, and you touched on the competitors in the space. I was wondering if you can um, expand more on that uh, briefly uh, about the competitors, uh, maybe for both the whole organ and the hepatocytes and how it's com compared to, for example, uh, in vitro production of hepatocytes. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me... Go ahead, yeah. please. Yeah, very good question, uh, Ben. I think there are a couple of uh, things I'd like to bring out is, let's start with the most uh, obvious question, right? So can we just take a human uh, or a pig liver and put it in humans? So there are already companies that are heavily funded and you know trying to use xenotransplantation you know, as a market space. The problem for these companies is that, I mean, a pig, I mean, liver, unlike heart or kidney, does mul multitude of functionality, right? It produces... 50% of our circulating proteins, including complement, clotting factors, and so forth. So for them, even though if they make them immune compatible, the functionality is a barrier for them. Um, like I illustrated here, so there are a host of proteins that needs to be produced, and it's unlikely that a pig organ can replicate the functionality of a human liver in a human patient. So that is at the level of the organ. When it comes to the hepatocytes, uh, and arguably, you can say we can make hepatocytes from induced pluripotent stem cells. So I, the, the, one of the major concerns is, even for a transplantation, assume that we could achieve that objective. Um, the, a small lobe within a liver uh, requires uh, to repopulate it would require like 3 billion cells. So uh, making hepatocytes to that scale where we can even, even do or attempt auxiliary transplants is going to be I mean, at this point, it looks like it's not a feasible exercise. Secondly, the hepatocytes that we are generating uh, from the from the pluripotent cells, they are they don't have all the hallmarks of hepatocytes. They look like a primitive or early hepatoblast-like population. Mm -hmm. So, in that they also express alpha beta protein and so forth. So, generating fully functional, fully matured human hepatocytes in the dish is still a barrier that has not been overcome. And secondly, to be able to then scale it down to scale it up to a point where we can reliably translate them to cell therapies is it's not an immediate or uh, it's not a tractable goal uh, at this point. So I think that this, uh, this opportunity, that's why the pig or even the hosts are considered because they do this more effectively than what we can replicate in the, in the dish. 
I hope I addressed your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it makes total sense. Um, so uh, we move to the next question. I uh, I, I noticed that you um, you know talked about the the perv the the way to use CRISPR to silence that. Um, and I know that's that's a very important um, concern for you know for safety reasons and for the FDA. Maybe you can talk about um, about the regulatory landscape. What does that look like, and what do you need for for approval um, to to get right. to, to get to the market? Right. So I think the first and foremost thing is, uh, I mean, at the level of functionality, we need to replicate. Um, either through an XVO or perfusion device where we are putting in human blood, hooking up our livers to a perfusion device and circulating a human blood through it. Um, this is initially what we're trying to do is to show that we overcome the immunological barriers. We, we are seeing evidence of normal functionality because livers can be put on a perfusion device and can be kept for at least five days uh, outside of the patients, right? So, um, So we're trying to see if we could, you know, get all of the safety data um, and efficacy data using this perfusion devices ex vivo. And from our preliminary conversations with uh, with FDA, it is pretty evident that they would like to have a solution for PERS before they would like to move, move it into the patients. Um, so the initial experiments that were done were based on emergency use authorization, meaning that these patients um, there is it's kind of done as a last resort, mm -hmm. but for it to be done, uh, and these patients are not eligible for receiving any transplants, so they're terminally ill patients, and that's hence emergency use. But for them to be used in a patients, um, I think they you know, it is pretty evident that we need perf solution a solution to perfs. Um, so I think we are starting with ex vivo devices, establish functionality, get all the parameters in and then eventually go to uh, human patients for transplantation. But that would require a series B round of funding. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a big lift. Uh, but just to, to follow on on that, um, if you will, um, so you have the ex vivo perfusion um, study um, plan. And then in addition, uh, what are the requirements in, in terms of, of um, animal models? Are, are there any requirements for um, small and large animal models for, for this kind of approval? Yeah, so I would probably think that, uh, um, so for us, I think going directly to the human patients is the best case scenario because it is pretty evident from our, most of the xenotransplantation studies that hooking up these organs or testing them in a non-human primate as a surrogate, um, those results are not really translating to humans. Mm -hmm. So because the primates in it themselves, they have other genetic modification that needs to be uh, made for them because they're not quite same in terms of their immune barriers. Mm -hmm. So if you make them compatible to non-human primates, then you may be able to transfer them to non-human primates, but the humans is still a big box, black box. Um, but that said, there could be opportunities where we could take them and do an auxiliary transplant into these uh, into these uh, animals and test the safety of them, efficacy of them, and so forth. So I believe going forward, there will be a brief period where we have to go into non-human primates for the initial validation studies, but. I think we will go for emergency use authorization as a mechanism to go into human patients, yeah, which I yeah. think would be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that that makes that makes sense. Thank you so much, Manu. Uh, maybe a last quick question, um, just so I understand the audience understands. Um, in a perfect world, when the system is is fully optimized, how long do you envision the the process taking from getting the iPSCs to a fully functional liver? Mm -hmm. So I think the plan. I mean, not I think the plan right now is go with allogeneic transplant, right? So off the shelf patient, you know, approved GPT stem cell lines that are validated for their cameras and potential. Then it is it is it can be 
plugged into our iterative process with the pigs. The advantage with the pigs is that they are a litter bearing animal, so they can generate more than one litter at a time. Uh, sorry, more than one pig at a time. So you can get four to six piglets out of, the, out of them. The pregnancy interval is four months. And they actually, these uh, animals, when they're born, they can be weaned after 21 days. So we believe that from the time we did the embryo transfer, it takes about six weeks, six months for us to get a liver that can be transplanted into patients or hepatocytes that can be harvested, mature hepatocytes that can be harvested. And since, like I said, it's an iterative process and uh, we are based on survival selection, so these, these can be scaled, the embryo transfers can be scaled, and the number of piglets on the other end can be increased. And for most of these applications, we don't probably need a whole liver. So in other words, you can take segments of the liver for transplantation, but use the rest of the liver for harvesting hepatocyte. So I think the it can be scaled effectively to a point where we can generate functional human hepatocytes uh, at scale for downstream applications. Uh, terrific. And uh, even with the opportunity to have a, a personalized medicine approach, having a patient-specific uh, IPC, that, that would be um, pretty awesome as well. Right. So Great. that would add another two months to the process, right, to establish patient-specific stem cell lines. And I think it will be prudent for us to partner with um, ReproCell or some of these other organizations to derive these stem cell lines under GPT conditions and then plug them into our pipeline. Great. Thank you so much, Manu. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. George Atanakovich. Dr. Atanakovich is a hematologist, oncologist, and a professor of medicine. He's currently the director of cancer immunotherapy and the medical director of the cellular therapeutics GMP laboratory at the University of Maryland Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Atanakovich joined University of Maryland in 2020, where his group develops novel immunotherapeutic approaches for patients with hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. Dr. Atanakovich has published more than 150 papers, had more than 50 clinical trials, hold patents and received multiple awards in the area of translational cancer research. Next, we'll hear more from Dr. Atanakovich about his clinical research. The title of his talk is a phase one study of tri-specific RT cells for patients with relapsed refractory B-cell lymphomas. Welcome, George. Uh, thank you, Ben, for the kind introduction and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our clinical uh, study today. So uh, here in Maryland, we decided uh, to develop a platform that allows for the development of novel cellular immunotherapies. And we decided to call this the cellular immunotherapy platform or uh, platform for cellular immunotherapies. I'm heading this whole construct and it consists of three components. The first one would be research and development. And then you have the cell therapy production component, and then you have the antigen expression and immunomonitoring component. So these are all the wonderful people that participate in this endeavor. And uh, as a first proof of principle project, um, or, uh, we decided to focus on B-cell lymphoma or patients with B-cell lymphoma. And that's the patient population where we currently treat most of them or a lot of them using CD19 CAR T cells. So CD19 CAR T cells, as you all know, they have revolutionized the treatment for B-cell lymphomas in general. However, uh, unfortunately, as many as 50% of, of all uh, patients receiving CD19 CAR T cell treatments will still relapse within the first year after the treatment. So, Many of them relapse because of loss of the target antigen from their tumor cells. And as a, a conclusion, there is still a critical and unmet need to enhance the efficacy of CAR T cells in this patient population and improve the depth and durability of the responses in patients uh, with relapsed refractory B-cell lymphoma. 
So then our question was, how can we address this problem? How can we solve this problem? And one way to do this would be to not just target one antigen like the CD19 antigen that most of the currently available uh, treatments um, target, but to use more than just one, use CD19 and CD22 as a B cell surface antigen, or even include a third one like the CD20. So that's what we decided to do is target multiple up to three target antigens simultaneously in, in, in the patient. And that's what we call the triple CAR approach or the tri-specific uh, CAR T-cell approach. So let me talk a little more about the tri-specific CAR T-cells. How did this all start? So we've developed this whole idea in collaboration with a Maryland-based company, Milteni and Maryland-based Lentigen. And how this started is again, we said, let's simultaneously target three basal leukemia and lymphoma antigens. And we thought that this is a promising strategy to be prevent uh, downregulation of target antigen and subsequent antigen loss mediated relapse in patients with B-cell malignancies. This is actually what the car looks like. So um, Milteni and Lentigen, they've initially, they've uh, developed four different types of car cars. What we're using is this um, uh, a car, this specific car. So it consists of two main components. So you basically, what you have is two different cars combined in a tandem car. So on the left, that's the one car here, and it has a CD20 targeting domain. It has a CD19 targeting SCFE, and it has an OX40 co-stimulatory domain. So this first car is connected to a second car in the same construct, and the second car targets the CD22 antigen on the uh, two, uh, malignant B cells. And this car has an ICOS co-stimulatory domain. So it's the combination of these two cars in just one construct that hopefully will do the trick. So these are some pre preclinical results. This is just the expression and what you can see of, of, of the cars on the cell surface. And what you can see is really, uh, this is CD19 and this is CD22, that these two cars are simultaneously expressed on the cell surface of the T cell uh, uh, from the patient, let's say. <clears throat> these are results from some mouse experiments. What you can see here, this is the car that we are gonna use. And uh, what you can see is that when they use just single cars, this is the classical CD19 CAR T cells, CD20 CAR T cells, uh, CD22 CAR T cells. When they use them separately, there were some responses there, but all the mice relapsed eventually. When they used the uh, triple CAR or the tri-specific CAR, they achieved very durable responses and none of the mice actually relapsed. At, any point in time. So these are preclinical results. What we are obviously, what we're gonna do is we'll produce clinical grade CAR T cells and the cells will be produced in the Fanny Angelus cell Cellular Therapeutics GMP lab at the University of Maryland. So that's, that's a fact accredited lab that I'm heading as their medical director. I'm very working very closely with Kim Henke, obviously. And this is where we'll produce the clinical grade triple CAR T cells for our study. Now in this lab, in the Angelus, uh, Fanny Angelus uh, lab, we've produced different types of uh, cellular uh, products already. We've worked on uh, cardiac stem cells, pancreatic islet cells, and other types of CAR T cells. But, but for this product, as I just explained, we'll focus on the tri-specific uh, CAR T cells. So on this, you are all aware of this production process, I believe, but this is how it works. So you collect cells from the patient and then <clears throat> you separate T cells, you activate the T cells, then you transduce them. This is how you bring the car into the cells and then you'll grow them, you'll expand them. And then you'll arrive at a stage where you have a final car T cell product. And this typically takes about two weeks, about 14 days. 
Um, and we've been able to bring this down to about eight days at the moment. Uh, and we're hoping to bring it further down to maybe six or seven days even. Um, so again, this is the whole production process. This is what it looks like. We're using the Clinimex uh, Prodigy system to produce these cells. It's a closed system. And these are actually uh, numbers from our most recent recent uh, production runs for our triple CAR T cells. So these are actually uh, the CAR T cells that I just told you about. It's the tri-specific CAR T cells. And if you use the Prodigy machine to produce them, then after eight days, for example, you have something like in between 2 billion or 4, million, 4 billion cells. So it's just a very, very large number of CAR T cells that you're gonna get and that you'll be able uh, to use um, uh, in, in the patient. And that's actually more than we actually need for this whole study. It's way more than uh, what we need to treat uh, a single patient. So overall, we've done three production runs already. And I, I can tell you, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've achieved so far. So if you look at, at the transduction rates, so these are the T cells expressing, in this case, the CD19 car. And these are the T cells after eight days of expansion expressing the CD22 car uh, on their cell surface. And for both uh, uh, cars, we could show that the transduction rates, um, transduction uh, efficiency is about, or anywhere between 45% and 65 or 70%. So that's pretty high. And we're pretty, pretty happy with these results for the first three clinical grade CAR T cell, tri specific CAR T cell products produced in our lab. So, and then when we had generated all these data and gained enough confidence in our production process, that's when we said, now we get need to open the study, the clinical study as soon as possible. And this is a little bit, a little bit about our, uh, the design of the clinical study. So these are our main inclusion criteria. So we decided to keep it pretty broad. So any kind of B-cell lymphoma will be allowed. So low-grade, high-grade B-cell lymphoma, they can all be included uh, in our study. We will include patients who developed a relapse of their disease after the first two lines of treatment. And again, we tried to keep this pretty open and broad. And we said any kind of prior treatment is allowed. So even prior CAR T cell, like the standard CD19 CAR T cells would be allowed. So if someone relapses after CD19 uh, CAR T cells, they can still go on our study and receive the hopefully more effective triple CAR. And then even uh, prior bite treatment will be allowed. Even allo CAR T cells, uh, allogeneic CAR T cells will be allowed. And then our main exclusion criteria, obviously they, they will include any kind of um, active infection in the patient, any, any like, second malignancy or other type of malignancy in the patient, any medical condition requiring prolonged immunosuppression. And we also decided to exclude patients who have uh, lymphoma in their brain. Primary endpoints for this study will include uh, incidence of any adverse events uh, or dose limiting toxicities. So it's going to be all about for this early phase clinical study, study it will be all about safety, obviously, uh, for the patient. And then secondary endpoints will include efficacy and pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. The immunogenicity, which means uh, anti-CAR T cell antibodies and anti-CAR T cell T cells, disease biomarkers, and I think this part here is very important as well. So, uh, CAR T cell persistence, we we'll look at that. CAR T cell exhaustion in the patient, and CAR T cell function uh, in the product and uh, in the patient after they've received their treatment. 
This is what the study design looks like. Again, we're hoping to enroll a total of 15 patients. And what we're gonna do is open enrollment uh, very soon. And then uh, uh, we'll try to enroll a total of 15 patient with, patients within just one year. And uh, assuming a production uh, failure rate of maybe hopefully about 20%. So then we'll be able to uh, treat 12 out of uh, the 15 patients. This is the treatment period. So it all starts with the leukapheresis. So you collect the white blood cells from the patient and then you'll do the lymphodepleting chemotherapy and then you'll apply the CAR T cells followed by, uh, by a prolonged follow-up uh, for of up to two years. This is a closer look actually at the treatment protocol, just to show for those of you who are not directly involved in all this, so you screen the patient, you do leukapheresis, you enroll them, and then you will perform lymphodepleting chemotherapy with the uh, uh, treatments uh, indicated below. And then uh, after that, you'll apply your CAR T cells at the doses indicated, and then you'll perform follow-up. These are the different dose levels. So as I said, this is a, it's gonna be a safety focused dose escalation schedule. So we decided to start at an intermediate dose of 1 million cells per kilogram body weight. And then if this goes well, and there are no significant dose limiting toxicity, we'll increase the dose to 2.5. And if there are dose limiting toxicity and we'll have to dose reduce, then we'll go back to a lower dose level. Um, there will be three patients uh, per group, and it's a, basically a modified three plus three study design. I'm also very proud of the translational research program that we've been able to set up for this study. So these are again, our secondary endpoints. And let me just very quickly focus on three of these which are, I think uh, are, are very important and of major relevance. So we look into CAR T cell persistence. As you all know, this has been shown to be an important biomarker. We've been able to set up a flow cytometry protocol for these patients where we uh, are able to stain their CAR T cells. So collect blood from the patient, stain their blood, using a recombinant target protein. So in these patients, we will use CD19, CD20, CD22, a recombinant protein coupled to a fluorescent to the fluorescent molecule. And then we're able to identify these CAR T cells in the patient's blood using flow cytometry. We set up another protocol where we're able to measure a whole range of cytokines in the patient's blood and actually in a very, very small volume of just 11 microliters to simultaneously measure a whole range of 22 different cytokines in the patient's blood. And this is just an example of someone, a patient who received, in this case, BCMA targeting CAR T cells for the multiple myeloma. And down here, you can see uh, uh, the CAR T cells in the patient's blood over time. So, so, and we found that when they, at the time point, when they experience a peak in their CAR T cell levels up at about 14 days after receiving the treatment, that's when they also show peak levels in certain cytokines, uh, such as granzyme B, IL-10 and MIP-alpha. And, and uh, at the time when they experience um, side effects from the treatment, like the cytokine release syndrome, so at that time, they show a different peak in, in, in different cytokines, like in this case, the interferon gamma, IL-10 and M MCP-1. So what I'm saying is I'm, uh, I think this is a very meaningful time to, uh, a way to find out what's going on in the patient uh, after you've uh, treated them using CAR T cell. So we'll use the same uh, methods and approach for the tri-specific CAR T cell study and what you could do is you you can't you you know you can, can don't need to just focus on blood you can basically measure CAR T cells in any uh, body uh, compartment of the body so this is someone who has CNS lymphoma and we measured CAR T cells in their brain uh, so that's something that we're going to do 
in case it's necessary uh, uh, for this study, uh, the tri-specific Artisa study as well. So then another phenomenon that we decided to look into is cortisol exhaustion. And I'm mentioning this because this is another very important tumor escape mechanism. That's how these treatments can potentially fail is because the CAR T cells over time, they get more and more exhausted and they lose their efficacy. So we're gonna look into this as well in our patients for this uh, clinical study. And this is just a very quick example of someone again with multiple myeloma who received BCMA CAR uh, T cells. And we were able to demonstrate that at the time when the CAR T cells lost their efficacy, unfortunately in this patient, uh, that's when the CAR T cells in the patient's bone marrow, again, they expressed uh, an exhaustion marker. Uh, in this case, it was the TIM3. So this is, again, something that we'll apply to this clinical study as well. And I think that's something where we'll be able to really obtain some very uh, helpful and meaningful results. Um, so, and then the third and final point is, uh, I've always wondered why is it that we very often we don't know actually uh, what exactly are we administering to the patient? Because at least when it's a clinical product, uh, we don't have a lot of information on what's in the bag that we're giving to the patient. So, and I think that shouldn't be the case for for this, for our tri-specific CAR T-cell query. I think we should know every little detail about what we're doing. And that's why we set up another uh, method and that's a plate-based uh, CAR T fluorospot method where, and that's again, it's an example from a, a CAR T-cell product. So that's a CAR T-cell product right before it was infused into the patient. And we were looking at the production of different types of cytokines indicated by all these different uh, colors uh, uh, using the CAR actual CAR T cell product before it was infused into the patient. So you can measure cytokine production like interferon gamma, granzyme BT and F alpha on a single cell level simultaneously. And then you will find out how active are the CAR T cells that you give to the patient before you give them to the patient. And I think that will provide us with some very helpful information as well. I think the, the, the bottom line would be for all these methods and all the questions that we're asking is the ultimate goal is to further and further improve uh, the products that we give to the patient and eventually also improve the outcomes, obviously, uh, for our patients with B cell lymphomas and other types of uh, cancer. Um, so none of this would have been possible without our the people that are involved in all this. So this is our clinical research management office. And these are all our collaborators and supporters at the University of Maryland and Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George, for a fascinating talk. I really love the uh, the GMP capabilities and the reduction time to um, to eight days for for manufacturing of T cells, and and I also like the partnership between um, University of Maryland and Milteni. It's a it's a great testimony of the of an academic industry collaboration um, in Maryland. Um, I I think we have. Um, um, a couple minutes for a few questions, if you will. Um, so if you've highlighted the um, how triple CAR T is um, superior to standard CAR T um, therapy, um, I was wondering um, if there are any other tri CAR T um, therapies out there in clinical trials right now, and if there are, if yours are um, different than those that are currently out there. Yes, th that's a great question. Um, um, uh, there are actually not just there. There, there are a number of bi-specific or duo-specific CAR T cells out there, uh, and they also have achieved uh, remarkable results. I would say for tri-specific CAR T cells, I can think of uh, uh, two early phase studies that are currently open worldwide. 
so we picked this specific construct for a reason. And the reason is, uh, I went over this just very briefly, is uh, the design of this specific car. So mm -hmm. it has two specific coastal military domain, the X40 and the ICOS. And, and there, there's a, 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 a large number of studies supporting the central role of these two coastal military domains in the, uh, in the efficacy and uh, uh, of, of CAR T cells in general. So this is why we speak this specific construct because in my opinion, it's the out of everything that's currently available, this is the most advanced and the most promising uh, combination of th three different cars plus um, these two specific coastal inventory domain. Great. I look forward to seeing it in action. <laughs> um, can you um, uh, briefly describe um, the first line of therapy in, in, in your patients and what would classify them as refractory patients? So this depends a little bit on, as I, as I just said, for a reason we to decide to keep these the, uh, the inclusion criteria as broad as possible. So there's basically no type of B-cell lymphoma that won't be eligible other than B-cell ALL. So ac acute leukemia, we decided to uh, uh, not include it. But other than that, all the different high-grade, low-grade lymphomas will be eligible. So obviously it depends a little bit on the type of lymphoma that we're talking about. For the standard of care patient, I would say for most of the patients, their uh, the most commonly treatment um, used treatments would include something like chemotherapy, like ARCHOP, so chemotherapy combined with an anti uh, CD20 antibody, ARCHOP, for example. And as I said, uh, I, I believe personally that many of our patients will have failed a prior CAR T cell treatment as well. So uh, any type of treatment that they receive, including standard chemotherapy plus immunotherapy or any type of cellular immunotherapy, including car prior CAR T cells. And then after receiving these treatments, they relapse and their tumor starts to grow again, uh, as indicated by imaging, like on the PET scan and so forth. So if, if, if that's happening, tumor progression after an initial initially uh, uh, effective treatment, that's defined as a refractory uh, uh, and, uh, a disease. And, and so we tried to, to keep this as broad as possible because we really, really didn't want to uh, exclude anyone from this uh, very promising treatment. Absolutely. Great, thank you for that. Um, and um, we kind of out of time. So uh, let me ask a kind of a, a, a non-technical question, if you will. Uh, so prior to um, to Maryland, to coming to Maryland, you were at the Cancer Institute of the University of Utah. Um, I, I was wondering if you can share with us uh, what brought you to, to Maryland. Yeah, that's actually a, ver a very, very good question. Because so we again, we did this. We drove cross country using our Fiat 500 <laughs> uh, two and a half years ago for a reason. <laughs> and the reason was... Uh, that um, I mean, they just have excellent uh, people. And you know, I showed the slide where there's everybody on it who plays a role here. And it's primarily, it's the people that work here. Uh, that's what decided, uh, uh, let's, that's, that's how we made the decision, I think. So I'm talking uh, specifically about Aaron Rappaport and his long standing experience in the field of cellular immunotherapies. And there's a whole range of other people who've been involved and helped with this. And then obviously this, this cancer center has a long tradition in translational research uh, as well. So this was the two main reasons. And I think it also helps that a lot of our friends work uh, close by at, at different institutions, at institutions at the NIH uh, and Johns Hopkins and everywhere and they're close by. So this is a very, very exciting and very inspiring community that exists here in Maryland. So that was the main reason for why we decided to come here. That sounds great. Thank you, George. Um, so we, we're out of time. So I just wanna um, 
say that I look forward to um, you um, opening this trial soon. Um, seems like you're you're almost there, and um, and I'm glad MCRF can be can be a part of this. Thank okay. you very much, Thank you, George. Thank you so much for everything and for your help with all this as well. Absolutely. Take care. I would like to welcome our next and final speaker, Dr. Luis Alvarez. Dr. Alvarez is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He's a decorated combat veteran and served 20 years on active duty with the U.S. Army. Luis holds a Ph.D. in biological engineering and a master's in chemical engineering from MIT. Dr. Alvarez is the CEO and founder of Theradaptive, an MIT spin-out company that is developing targeted protein therapeutics to regenerate tissues. Next, we'll hear more from Dr. Alvarez about Theradaptive and their GMP manufacturing plans. The title of his talk is Manufacturing of Bioinstructive Implants to Enhance Stem Cell Therapies. Luis, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Ben, for the uh, welcome, and it's a pleasure to be able to share what we're doing uh, with, the, with the audience. So today I'll be talking about uh, the manufacturing and design of bioinstructive implants to enhance uh, stem cell therapies. As a company, uh, Theradaptive started out uh, with the objective of solving a problem which occurs in uh, combat trauma, but also occurs every day among the civilian population. And that's this uh, problem of delayed amputation uh, that results from, in many cases, the non-healing or non-union of uh, bone tissue in an extremity. And eventually that bone, if it does not heal, will to be uh, amputated and uh, the person will be fitted for a prosthetic. And I felt that this problem was uh, solvable with uh, the emerging technology in the Regen Med and uh, Med device space. So uh, based on, uh, on this as a challenge, I developed the technology while I was at MIT. <clears throat> and then uh, when I left the army, uh, spun out the company uh, to develop this tech and uh, now we're about 20% company in Frederick, Maryland, with operations also in, uh, in Boston. And uh, we have developed now the ability to, to, to uh, design therapeutics that uh, interact with implants in such a way that they can be presented persistently and with spatial uh, precision uh, so that native tissue can be regenerated. In the process of solving this original problem, we actually, uh, by mistake, invented a new capability, which is the ability to, to apply this also to any, basically any protein that you want. So now we have a platform for targeted delivery of recombinant protein therapeutics on uh, virtually any material uh, for uh, many, many different applications. The lead application is in uh, spinal fusion and orthopedic repair because of our origin, uh, but uh, we've now started to apply this technology in solid tumor uh, applications where you want local but persistent delivery of therapeutics that act uh, locally. So our lead product in spine is uh, going into what is essentially a phase one, two. We were able to skip uh, the phase one enrollment period uh, based on the safety uh, profile of the product. So we will uh, be moving ahead with that uh, in those studies later this year. Uh, and that same product has earned three breakthrough designations from the FDA. So we're very pleased about uh, this. So the platform itself really uh, can be viewed this way. If you start at the bottom, you have an, an indication, clinical indication. In the center, you have the current uh, state-of-the-art an implant or device that may be used in those indications. Um, most of those devices, of course, only offer a mechanical function, do not offer a biological function. Uh, but a biological function would be desirable in many cases. So with our tech, now you can uh, load a protein uh, biologic onto the implant or scaffold to bring about a desired effect. So I call this loading biological software onto medical hardware. And as a, a smaller company, we have focused uh, on a couple of indications, like I said in the beginning, spinal fusion, uh, orthopedics, anywhere you, you need to regenerate bone. Uh, but we've started to apply this in other areas like oncology. So in principle, how this works is that you can take your implant or material scaffold uh, you dip it into the protein solution of the engineered protein that we have developed, and it will stick to that implant with very high affinity, almost like a paint. So the core of our technology is to re-engineer the protein so that it gains the function of binding to the implant material without losing its original biological function. 
So this allows you to eliminate the need for exotic chemistries or post-processing methods. From a manufacturing workflow uh, standpoint, it's uh, very easy. You simply dip into the solution and 95% of that protein is coated onto that surface within 10 to 15 minutes. So it's a very easy wor workflow. So we've started expanding operations here to build out a facility to do this manufacturing in uh, Frederick, uh, Maryland. Uh, and this facility will manufacture all of our spinal fusion and orthopedic uh, implants as a final fill finish uh, space. In addition to that, we've done quite a bit of uh, therapeutic scale up work in uh, manufacturing the protein. Uh, although we do the GMP manufacturing of the recombinant proteins uh, offsite, that's something that we hope to bring in, in, in house um, eventually. But we do all the early development of those therapeutic proteins, uh, everything leading up to, but not including the GMP manufacturing uh, on site. So the lead product, uh, is your, if you might be curious what it's really composed of, it really has two parts. One is the implant itself, which is a cottony electrospun uh, material, which contains a reservable polymer plus uh, an inorganic uh, calcium phosphate, which is used very commonly in orthopedics, uh, together with a protein that we have developed, uh, which is a proprietary variant of BMP2 called AMP2. So AMP2, binds with extremely high affinity to calcium phosphate uh, inorganic uh, materials. And so the final product that we developed is this uh, cottony material coated with a therapeutic uh, protein. And this product uh, very potently induces bone formation wherever it's placed in the body, but has the added uh, feature that it will only produce bone where the implant is. So you do not have off-target or heterotopic uh, bone formation like you do with other products. So this uh, product also is classified in, in, uh, by the FDA as a class three device combination product, which allows it to follow a, a pre-market uh, authorization path as opposed to BLA path. And that's very efficient uh, in terms of time to market and, and other aspects. The product itself um, is easily used in the OR by um, either placing it dry into the uh, implant or defect site or mixing it with other fluids or stem cells. So for example, a popular um, method here for reconstituting bone is to actually take bone marrow that is rich in uh, mesenchymal stromal cells and other progenitors uh, and adding it to the implant. And uh, with our product design, you're able to do that. So in this sense, the, the implant uh, actually potentiates the uh, action of those stem cells to become the tissue of interest. So in addition to being a standalone therapeutic, um, we also see a lot of potential for use together with cell therapies that uh, maybe have not uh, yielded the results that were expected. Uh, we can now load them onto an implant that has uh, biologic signaling that will potentiate the, the full effect and a desired uh, function of those stem cells. So how does this uh, measure up to the competition right now? The, the current and really only market uh, leader in recombinant biologics for bone repair is uh, Medtronic. They have a product called Infuse, which contains a uh, lyophilized form of bone morphogenetic protein two that's reconstituted and then squirted onto a sponge. And that sponge has to be placed in the implant site without uh, diffusion. And that is very difficult to achieve because uh, the protein is not interacting with the material. And so you get uh, actually pretty significant off-target effects from this product when used uh, in certain parts of the body. For example, uh, off-target bone formation or edema, you know, swelling. In contrast, if you preload the implant with the protein of interest, uh, in this case, AMP2, uh, you do not get any diffusion of the protein away from the device. So you have no concerns about off-target effects in that regard. And it's a lot easier to use because you do not have to do any uh, processing in the OR. So we see this as a big improvement in the current state of the art in uh, recombinant uh, biologics for orthopedics and spine. Here's an example of its use uh, in a preclinical study. The uh, physicians that helped guide the design and, and, uh, and uh, other aspects of this product were really helpful with the hands-on experience they have. And uh, actually the product uh, becomes putty-like when mixed with any fluid. So that's actually a form factor that's been very uh, desirable for use by physicians. Also, it conforms very easily to other hardware. So in these applications, you have uh, you know, metal 
uh, other components that are more permanent uh, that uh, may remain in place. So we needed a product that also was able to work in conjunction with those. So the protein itself, AMP2, is loaded onto this um, material. That, that combination product is called OsteoAdapt, and we've evaluated it in about 20 different animal studies. We've beaten the standard of care in every study to date, but to give you an idea of the potential of what you can do when you can uh, persistently and uh, very locally <clears throat> present a recombinant biologic, uh, here's a, a study in a goat. Uh, a tibial defect uh, is created of five centimeters of segmental defect as shown in panel one. An inert spacer is placed in the defect site for about a month to halt all healing. And then after that month, the test article is placed. So here you see an example of osteodapt placed into the wound geometry. It conforms to the geometry. Um, in this case, uh, marrow cells were added to this construct. Uh, just to give you a snapshot of the data, which we can share offline in more detail, but after 12 weeks, you get full regeneration of the defect, which was uh, previously uh, five centimeters. Um, really no other product has demonstrated the ability to generate uh, fully anatomically correct regeneration of um, a defect of this size, including a fuse. So we're very encouraged by, uh, by this study. Uh, we repeated this study, in this case, in an IDE enabling uh, sheep segmental defect study that placed the material dry. Uh, you see that it wicks the surrounding material, but there's no requirement to mix it really with any cells or any other material. Uh, and we observed a similarly striking result here, the most striking features that by four weeks you have bone mineral density, which starts to approach uh, the density of the surrounding uh, tissue. And by eight weeks, it's uh, fully uh, unioned. So this represents a, a two to four X acceleration over what you would observe with uh, native BMP2 or with autograft, which is a current uh, best in class alternative. We were encouraged by this uh, type of result for regeneration. And lastly, I'll show data here related to spine fusion, which is the lead indication. Uh, we performed a study in sheep that looked at uh, vertebral fusion in the lumbar spine. And here the material is placed in a spinal cage, which adds separation between vertebrae. And the key things to take away here are one, that the uh, amount of bone formed at four weeks is almost comparable to the surrounding vertebrae. And two, that the precision of bone formation is limited to the placement of the implant, which was the original goal of this technology. We're very encouraged by the results of this work, uh, which are uh, finishing up the in-life portion in the next month or so before we begin to file uh, an IDE with the FDA. And of course, histologically, we look at the bone, it's very healthy and looks like native uh, bone. One of the important things to watch out for when you uh, develop therapeutics in this space. So the same uh, product, um, protein and, and uh, implant combination can be used in many different indications, spine, uh, cranial maxillofacial repair, orthopedics, wherever you have bone uh, forming. Uh, and so it becomes an efficient uh, development um, path because once you have an indication underway in the clinic for let's say spine, you can do a, a label expansion without having to redevelop the therapeutic for these other applications. And likewise, I uh, mentioned here this idea of binding therapeutics to a carrier. We leveraged the learnings that we had from the orthopedic program to actually develop uh, an oncology asset uh, that uh, leverages the local and persistent presentation of uh, therapeutics. So we're going into the clinic now with the spinal fusion um, as a lead indication. Uh, we will follow that up with uh, dental and trauma and um, advance then the uh, oncology application uh, to IDE phase over the next uh, 24 months. So we're uh, gearing up and ramping up operations across those uh, indications. Ben, I'm happy to take in any questions um, on this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Luis. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I would like to um, understand more about the clinical regulatory landscape. Uh, you've mentioned this is a, an IDE uh, versus a, an IND standard BLA. Maybe you can talk a bit more about that um, and, and your, your plans for, for approval and uh, release. 
Sure. So uh, one of the interesting things that happens when you uh, combine a biologic with a device is that <clears throat> the Office of Combination Products of the FDA will make a decision about how to designate it, and they have a choice. Either they can designate it where the lead review agency is uh, CDRH, Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, or uh, CBER, you know, biologics. And in many cases, if the, <clears throat> the primary expertise of the agency is with the device component, you're going to get designated as a, as a class three device, which uh, allows you to enjoy some benefits because um, the studies, uh, that not only in duration and size, uh, but also complexity, are much uh, simpler for PMA products than they are for BLA products. So in some ways, you can get a biologic to follow a PMA path. Uh, when otherwise you would have to follow a full BLA path. And I think that offers some some uh, significant benefits. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's uh, almost like an accelerated approval of sorts. Um, yes, by comparison, yeah. Um, so when are you planning to, um, uh, to um, go into patients currently? So we have our first studies in uh, spinal fusion starting uh, later this year. Uh, we're starting overseas in Australia and then uh, expanding uh, to study sites here in the U.S. in early 24. Wow, super. Um, and um, yeah, we have uh, we have some some time for for more questions, um, if if you will. Um, so you talked about the the differences uh, between your AM protein and and BMP, the the commonly known BMP protein. Maybe you can. Um, expand briefly more about that, the one step versus eight steps and preparation time uh, with the AMP. Um, be very interested to learn more about that. Sure. So uh, BMP2, you know, the BMP2 does not interact with the um, implant uh, materials that are present in the infused product. So the infused consists of the BMP2 in lyophilized form, which is reconstituted. And then the uh, sponge-like material on the bottom there is a collagen sponge. And the way it's administered is the BMP2 is reconstituted, and then the, the liquid with the protein is uh, placed onto that sponge and wicked into it. Now, the BMP2 is not bound. So if you squeeze the sponge or if you apply irrigation or suction during surgery, you can just log the protein very easily, and it will diffuse into the surrounding tissues to produce unwanted side effects. So in contrast, the protein that we developed, we took BMP2, we re-engineered uh, sequence uh, components of BMP2 to create a new molecule, new composition of matter that has the original biochemical signaling of BMP2 to induce bone, but that binds very, very tightly to certain uh, materials, in this case, calcium phosphates. So uh, we're able to paint essentially the surface of an implant with this M2, and the M2 will diffuse away. And uh, you will not suffer any, any increased risk from suction or irrigation because it's uh, it's stuck onto the surface. So once you are able to do that with the therapeutic, then it changes the type of product you can design and the safety profile and the efficacy profile because of the the mode of presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. Very impressive. Um, the um... I have another question in regards to I, I you know you showed the um, sheep and goat studies um, with the uh, large segmental defect. Um, are those um, um, load bearing? Um, have you have you looked at that? Um, those are fairly large defects. Yes. So the way those are done in the animal, because the animal is always load bearing is that an intermedullary nail is placed uh, into the defect. That way the animal can bear a load, uh, but you can also observe and study the regeneration of the bone around the nail. So in both cases, we used an intermedullary nail. And uh, in humans, what you would do, you know, you also can have nails placed like this. Uh, the physician can remove the nail after the bone is regenerated, and that's done from the top of the, of the limb of the knee. So um, this uh, permits load bearing and uh, regeneration to happen over the time course that needed to fully uh, support weight without the nail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have you have you looked at that? Have you looked at the um, um, at at, uh, at longer times? I think you've shown um, 
um, weeks after uh, implantation? So we have looked at uh, you know 24 weeks. Uh, we were not showing it here. Uh, and we also have looked at the, the bone strength, uh, the, the force to break the bone again after the uh, end point and have measured uh, forces which are greater actually than the uh, original bone that was formed uh, wow. or that was there. So uh, yeah, we looked at some of those data and it's it's, uh, it's very uh, promising. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, maybe you can talk about the, um, we, have, we have a couple more minutes. Maybe you can um, talk about, highlight some of the um, challenges in manufacturing uh, when we talk about the um, um, about M M two and the proteins uh, in, in general. Sure. So <clears throat> AMP is a recombinant protein, and uh, manufacturing recombinant proteins has its own set of challenges. Uh, we've developed um, a method of the, of uh, producing uh, these proteins uh, recombinantly in a microbial system. Uh, which of course requires refolding, but uh, we've gotten it to a point where it's uh, very economical um, compared to mammalian cell production. So uh, we feel very confident now in the ability to do this for many different proteins, not just AMP2. Uh, and we do have a GMP process established for the uh, protein production. Uh, we also have a manufacturing site in Texas where we combine the protein with the implant um, under uh, conditions that allow us to stabilize it and then package, seal, and then uh, actually we terminally sterilize. We're able to actually, we found that you can terminally sterilize proteins when bound to the surface like we do. So that allows you to manufacture non-aseptically, which simplifies the manufacturing greatly. Um, so uh, that's also under a GMP uh, process. So now the end-to-end -end manufacturing is fully GMP and uh, we're able to manufacture these products with uh, sufficient sterility right, to enable shelf uh, stable storage for long periods of time. And and how long are we talking about shelf, sta shelf stable for how long? Have you looked uh, we at have that? data that goes out to nine months and we're extending that data continuously. So our goal will be a two year uh, shelf life. Uh, very nice, very nice. Um, a final question, um, I'll be um, due to time. Um, so I know you've had some success in, in raising capital um, and um, was hoping you can um, share some of your insight for other companies that are in startup financial um, stages. And perhaps with that, you can elaborate or mention some of the roles MSCRF played in, in, in getting you uh, to where you are today. Yeah, non-dilutive uh, funding uh, from both the DOD and the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund has been uh, critical for the growth of the company. So we've received um, two uh, commercialization awards from MSCRF, as well as um, a venture investment from the uh, Maryland Tenco Venture Fund. And uh, that has enabled us actually to begin the early work that uh, led to this. So uh, I would say that work is in that uh, work of the uh, foundation has been uh, indispensable uh, to us. And, uh, you know, I would encourage uh, continued uh, activity in the space. And other companies can also benefit by applying to the various programs that MSCRF has. Uh, for example, we've recently applied to the manufacturing program, which I think is a relatively new addition, which helps companies then to scale out manufacturing and uh, yeah, hopeful on that one. But uh, yeah, very, very uh, supportive. Absolutely. Hope to see uh, a manufacturing plant in, in, uh, in Maryland, uh, Frederick, Maryland soon. That'll very good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luis, for, for your time today. I really appreciate this great talk. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for listening in today to our focus session. I would like to thank our speakers and ISCCR for the opportunity to present and highlight MSCRF's role in advancing some of the cutting edge research in Maryland. If you have any questions about anything that you've heard today, please don't hesitate to contact us directly. I've shared the, uh, our contact information um, as well as some of additional resources that again will be available on our website. Thanks again for joining.